it has okay been well great thank you so much welcome everyone to the capitola city council member for september 9th and we are returning from a closed session let's go ahead and begin with the pledge of allegiance I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. And Chloe, would you like to share a few words? I'm having trouble seeing you, Chloe. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Okay. I'm here. Hi. Thank you, Mayor Brooks. Yes. Hello. Welcome to the Capitola City Council meeting. In accordance with the California Governor's Executive Order N2920, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting using Zoom or a landline or mobile phone, along with how to submit public comment during the meeting tonight, is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, and on the published meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on the city's website. As always, the meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Our technician tonight is Kingston. Thank you so much, Mayor Brooks. Thank you, Chloe, and thank you, Kingston. We're now going to move on to item two. This is presentations, and 2A is Monarch Services on Domestic Violence and Community Resources presentation from Laura Segura and Caitlin Foster. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the two of you. Welcome. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having us, uh, council members. My name is Kaylin Foster Renda, and I am a co executive director at Monarch Services. And we thank you for providing space for us to share with you some alarming trends that we have been seeing with domestic violence in Santa Cruz County really since the onset of COVID and seems to be exacerbating as the months tick by. Or would you mind going to the next screen? Oh, one back. Perfect. So our numbers here um, that we'll share with you for our fiscal year last year, July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. The number of clients that we served was about 1,500. And the number of services we provided was 27,448, which was an increase of 75%. The number of crisis line calls that we received was an increase of 250%. And the number of shelter clients seeking services and seeking shelter was 150%. These numbers are significant, especially the shelter clients, because during the shelter in place orders, it was so difficult and during COVID to go into a shelter space. And so for clients to come forward and say, I need to leave and find shelter and know it's in community shelter, it's significant for sure. And really the most tragic number that I have to share with you today is that there have been five femicides in our county in, in less than one year. I've been with Monarch Services for 11 years, and in those 11 years, we hadn't had five femicides in our county. Next slide, please. There we go. Thanks so much. So it's important for, we, for us to understand the dynamics of domestic violence before we move on to what do we do about this. Um, uh, abusers seek power and control over the people they abuse. And it's very important to note that it's not always physical abuse. It's financial abuse, it's verbal abuse, it's emotional abuse. Uh, if there is a silver lining to any of this, um, it's that violence is a learned behavior and it can be unlearned. So having support and education for people who do harm does work and it can be a remedy to these issues that we're facing. And something that's very important for all, all of us to know is that the most dangerous time for a victim is immediately after they leave a violent relationship. So even if a restraining order is in place, when somebody leaves a relationship, that the increase in violence and femicide increases exponentially. And it's very important during that time that the person that has left the relationship has some kind of a safety plan so that they know if 
They have a bag with a cell phone, with money, with clothes. Um, they know their community's resources and have phone numbers that are handy should they need help. And now I will turn it over to Laura Segura, our other executive, co-executive director. Thank you everyone uh, for, having, for having us. Um, so Kaylin has given you a glimpse in terms of this pandemic that we're having around domestic violence in our community. And you're probably wondering, well, what is going on? What is causing all this? And I wanted to just share some insights in terms of why. We're not only seeing domestic violence, but we're seeing all forms of violence in our county. And one of the biggest causes of that is that when people are harming others, those people are folks that have had a history of trauma in their lives whether it is growing up in a family, uh, being abused, growing, witnessing violence as a child, uh, facing racism, uh, being homeless, uh, poverty, uh, that's a form of trauma. And so you see this layer upon layer upon layer of trauma and the body cannot handle this kind of what they call weathering effect and it creates a breakdown um, and in people's behaviors. So that has a lot to do with uh, why we're seeing this. People are unhealed. Um, and then on top of that, we have the pandemic, the trauma of going through this pandemic that most of us have experienced as well. And that's just an added layer of trauma. The other, uh, the other thing that we know is that poverty is a big driver of violence. So uh, folks are dealing with poverty. Uh, they're in unstable financial situations, especially during the pandemic. People have lost their jobs or there's job insecurity, um, et cetera. So that's another big driver for that. There's also uh, some victims are very dependent upon their partner uh, financially. And so there's that power and control that Kaylin was talking about as well. And when they don't have that, or that's a way for them to um, have control over their partner. There's also a lack of access to resources such as, such as childcare and mental health. I think we, it, whoops, sorry. Um, I think it's, sorry about that. Oh shoot. Uh, I, it's very, it's safe to say that we are dealing with a mental health crisis right now. People, as, as I mentioned earlier, with this historical trauma and people not being healed, mental health, the access to mental health services is more important than ever during this time. Uh, so that's a really important piece. People are, during the pandemic, were isolated from friends, family, and coworkers. And as victims of the violence, they really rely on those support systems to be able to navigate through those violent relationships and be able to seek support, seek help. But the pandemic did not lend itself to that because uh, folks, everybody was sheltered in, in place and that and being sheltered at home was not a, is not a safe place uh, for many victims of violence. Overcrowded housing conditions. Uh, people are are living in in these conditions, which create additional stressors for them. So all these different stresses, layer upon layer of stress, are really the main roots um, causes of violence. And what we're asking for our community, to, uh, we're calling for a call to action and how folks can help to support victims of violence. And one of the first things we ask is that uh, listen and believe. So when victims come forward, uh, being able to believe them. I think the Me Too movement came, came and people were able to report a lot of what had happened to them. But this was just very recent. This has been happening for many, many generations. And it's very, very shameful. It, a lot of victims feel shamed um, and they feel like they're the reason why this is happening to them. So it's really important that we not blame them or shame them. And being able to check in on our loved ones and neighbors, making sure that they 
have support systems, especially uh, now. Uh, we're still not completely out of the pandemics, but being able to check in on them and ensuring that they have resources and connections as well. And helping with safety planning, making sure that if you know that there is someone out there that is facing violence, that they have a plan B, being able to have things in their car so that if they need to flee their home, um, that they have those things, their license, their money, um, and le any legal documents that are gonna help them and being able to know where to go and who to call. So that's about around safety planning. And using social media to wear, raise awareness and provide resources, that's a really powerful platform that we see as a resource uh, for many looking to get out of these violent relationships. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the increased access to mental health service. That is something that we as a community really are urging our jurisdictions um, to, to really help support, um, especially uh, funding. You have the ability to fund programs and being able to support these kinds of programs is, is important. And then uh, speaking of that, um, being able to support critical community services for people with highest rates of trauma. And really, when you look at the different layers of trauma and people that are not healed, uh, it's really important. And there's a lot of research that is coming that has recently come out around trauma and that weathering effect and why it's so important to really be able to support and fund these programs that provide healing and address, um, provide mental health services to those. So that concludes our presentation. Here is additional information about us. Uh, with our website and our 24-hour support and crisis line. People can call this number um, if they have questions around what to do, if they have questions about a family member, a neighbor, don't know what to do, don't know how to support them, or someone is in crisis and wants to flee, uh, they can also call this 24-hour support, support and crisis line, and um, we have bilingual staff on uh, 24 hours a day. So that concludes our presentation and we'd like to open it up for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Vice Mayor Story, for bringing this um, very important issue to light this, this evening. Council members, do you have any questions for our guests this evening? Council Member Bertrand. Council member, you're muted. Okay. Yeah, I was really taken back about the um, the issue of after a breakup and there's a um, a possibility of violence. That initial period is really dangerous for the um, the people involved for the ladies in this particular case mostly. So. Um, that, I, I believe, calls for a lot of education of the community. It's, it's pretty obvious you hear it in newspaper articles and stuff. So my first question is, um, is that an education opportunity for this organization? I assume it is, and I was wondering how you do it. My second question is, it seems to me that when someone needs to reach out, there's a lot of hesitancy for a variety of reasons. Um, maybe they feel a stigma might be attached to them. I, I don't know. I was just wondering if you could comment about that because that has to over, be overcome. And if that's not the case, let me know. But I, I, it seems to me that has to be overcome. And I was wondering how the organization does this. Great, thank you so much for the question. I can address the, um, when we do safety planning, when we know somebody's going to be leaving a relationship, we do extensive work with our clients. Um, we have safe confidential shelter, if that is something that needs to happen. We have partnerships with sister agencies throughout the state, so we can always house folks if, we, if it seems like it's going to be um, a, a very violent situation if they should leave just based on historical information from that relationship. Um, so there's a number of things that we do with our clients, but certainly we let them know that that is a fact and that happens so that there is awareness around that. 
Um, and we also work very closely with law enforcement so that when restraining orders are made, we, we have our clients keep those orders with them at all times. They have photos on their phones um, so that they're able to get that information should there be an altercation that happens. So it's a lot of education with our existing clients, um, and we do use our social media platforms and our newsletters extensively to share this critical information. And if I can just add it. People often ask the question, why doesn't she just sleep? And uh, it's really important that when that person leaves a relationship, again, it's a very dangerous time, and that's why we're providing this information is because it is very oversimplified. Um, it sounds easy to do, but it's actually a very, very dangerous time. And many of the femicides, most of the femicides that we had in our, have had in our county are a direct result of the women trying to get out of those relationships. Thank you so much, Laura, for sharing that. And, you know, as you had mentioned, there is huge stigma um, right. in the past around somebody that has experienced domestic violence. Uh, women have historically been blamed and shamed for what did you do to bring this on, um, you know, before the, the 70s and into the early 80s. Um, it wasn't even a crime on the books. And so, you know, the person was like had a, a cool down period where they were taken around the block. So it wasn't taken seriously. And it's, it's not been until recent times that there has been a lot of education around um, that women have the right to leave a relationship, that they should not be ever blamed for that. But there's a lot of stigma and it's so difficult when children are involved, when women are financially dependent on the partner that's causing harm. So there are so many factors, you know, with family relationships, with all of these, the web of um, a relationship that any relationship is, it just is very complex. Thank you. And, and, oh, and I was just, I'm sorry, I see one other question from Vice Mayor Story. I just want to pop in, Vice Mayor Story. Well, oh, thank you. Um, and um, one, I just want to, I want to thank Kaylin and Laura for giving us this presentation on a very sobering uh, topic. Um, it, it was shocking to me to hear that we've had five femicides here in our Santa Cruz County. I, 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 you know, I just find that so hard to believe. And I guess what I wanted to ask, I, I know that um, Monarch Services provides uh, resources, a hotline um, and a shelter but um, are there um, low cost or no cost uh, counseling or, or, or therapy or anger management um, um, therapies or for perpetrators uh, of uh, domestic violence? Because uh, it seems to me that those are the people that we really need to reach out to and to reach and intercede with. Thank you, that's a great question. Um, and thank you, Council Member Story, for inviting us uh, to be part of this. And yes, we have recently shifted um, to provide services to the entire family. Sir, uh, victims have been asking us for many, many years uh, to be able to provide that for their families, including their partner, um, who is also the person that has harmed them. And so we are now providing those sessions um, we just launched it earlier this year. Uh, it's called Positive Solutions Program, and mm -hmm. we provide it's a more holistic type of approach uh, to addressing violence in the home, including we provide counseling um, for children, we provide counseling for the victim, and of course the person that has harmed them as well. So hopefully being able to address and support the entire family holistically, which then extends out to a safer, uh, healthier community as well. Excellent, thank, thank you. Council Member Kaiser. Thank you. Yes, Kayla and Laura, thank you so much. Um, it, that's super encouraging to hear about the taking on more of the family counseling aspect, because obviously, kids are sponges and they absorb all these things that they see and hear and whatnot. And that only perpetuates and continues on um, for a lifetime. So uh, that getting to the root of it is where I 
think, yeah, the, the most effort needs to be put. And um, thank you for providing these services that are much needed. And I look forward to sharing your, your posts and things like that on social media as well, because you never know who it might reach and who it could help. So thank you very much. Thank you, too. Well, thank you again to the two of you for all that you're doing for it, for the advocacy of, of our community and for women um, across the county. Thanks again for coming this evening. Thank you so much for having us. All right, everyone. We're going to now move on to item three. This is a report out on closed session. Samantha, do you have a report? Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, direction was given to staff on both of the items on the closed session agenda. Thank you. All right, thank you, Samantha. Item four, additional materials. Do we have any additional materials to be added? Yes, Mayor Brooks, there were uh, two public comment emails received regarding item eight, excuse me, item 9A, which is the 720 Hill Street Hotel conceptual review. Okay, thank you. And now on to item five, any additions or deletions to the agenda? Staff has no changes this evening. Great, and item six, oral communications. What is that? So this is public comment, which is the opportunity for uh, the public to address us on items that are not listed on tonight's agenda or are listed on the consent calendar. Thank you, Jamie. So we'll go ahead and open this up to the public. Do we have any items, um, or excuse me, do we have anyone who with a hand is raised or any emails for items not on tonight's agenda? Mayor Brooks, I see uh, one person wishing to talk on this item. It's Lisa Berkowitz. Okay, Lisa. And this is for items not on tonight's agenda. You have three minutes. Welcome. Yes, good evening, Mayor and City Council members, Lisa Berkowitz, Community Bridges. I'm the Program Director of Meals on Wheels, and um, I was glad to see that on the consent agenda for this evening's meeting, uh, there's the recommendation to adopt the proposed resolution to accept the CDBG grant. Um, your consideration of the grant will in part support important food services for Capitola residents. So. Thank you in advance to secure additional funding to address the important issues of food insecurity and invest in the nutritional well-being of Capitol residents. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. All right, now moving on. Any other hands, Larry, or email? Um, Mayor Brooks, I do not see any other hands raised for, for oral communication, and I do not have any emails on this item. Okay, great. We'll now move on to item seven. This is an opportunity for council comments or staff comments. We'll begin with staff. Mayor Brooks, I have one announcement this evening. <clears throat> uh, yesterday, I received word that our public health department believes that the county has moved into the substantial tier, but uh, that's one better than the highest tier of high. Uh, according to the CDC in terms of their tracking and how much uh, community spread of COVID there is in Santa Cruz County. Uh, the decrease to substantial represents a 52% decrease in cases over the last seven days and reduced hospital admissions. Um, the next move that the CDC would make for the county if they were to move us down to the, um, the tier, the next lower tier, would take us away from having the indoor masking requirements. So if everyone's probably focused on that, I will note that the CDC website still lists us in the high tier, but I do have confirmation from the county that they believe that we have been uh, moved down to the substantial tier. Thank you. Council Member Bertrand. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to report out on a meeting, uh, RTC meeting of September 2nd. Um, we dealt with the Capitola trestle. We did an update on the conceptual study to repurpose the bridges. There's five of them to a multi-purpose, multi-use trail. So I'll read the recommendations that the RTC um, agreed to. 
So two recommendations. We'll proceed with the prioritization of the pre-construction activities needed to rehabilitate the existing timber and wrought iron bridges. Number two, we'll work with the county public works staff to consider including the deck conversion work in the environmental analysis for the coastal rail trail segments 10 and 11. So you could go to the meeting minutes and find out more about this. But at this point, the only thing that is actually able to take any load up to the E80, which is the recommended load, are the concrete sections of segment A and segment E. Um, there's no rating on the timber trestles, as you can imagine. So a lot of this work to figure out the condition of the grid of our trestle is going to be focused on that. And also the iron deck truss is at an E29, way below the E80. So you can imagine it's not really capable of carrying a heavy load. But more will come out of this with the study. And the idea here with this study is <clears throat> can um, <coughs> a sufficient amount of work be done so that it could be turned into a trail segment at this initial stage. And um, we'll find out more at the next meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Peterson. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can. OK, thanks. Sorry, you're going to hear me say that a lot tonight as I'm uh, dealing with this new kind of audio dialing in instead of using my computer. So I apologize in advance. Uh, I just have two things that I wanted to touch on. The first is that this weekend is the exciting return of the Art and Wine Festival. Uh, I will be working the Glass and Token booth number one at the end of the um, uh, Esplanade and Stockton Avenue on Saturday from uh, 1.30 to 6, but the last uh, sales will be at 5.30. Uh, those of us that are working in booths will be wearing masks. And while masks aren't required uh, outdoors at this time, we, you know, I would definitely encourage anyone who is going to be uh, participating to consider wearing a mask when you're not uh, sampling the wine uh, during the event because, as mentioned, it would be really great if we could move into a tier uh, in which we could get rid of our indoor masking requirements. So uh, stay safe out there. The uh, other thing that I wanted to touch on, and you'll be hearing from me about this quite a lot, um, in the coming years and, and probably from AMBAG staff and, and uh, likely even our staff. Um, last night at the AMBAG meeting, we had a presentation. Uh, AMBAG, for, for those listening and who aren't aware, is the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. Um, and we received a presentation last night from a senior policy analyst at the California Department of Housing and Community Development to share with us uh, some information about uh, RENA allocations and our regional housing needs um, uh, assessment. And I just wanted to kind of share this because I think it's really important that we all prepare for what's coming. Um, it, it, we're in cycle six of RENA allocations. Uh, in cycle four, our, the, the region that includes Santa Cruz and Monterey County indicated we needed about 15,000 new housing units uh, between the two counties. Uh, cycle five, four years ago, was a little over 10,000. They're uh, estimating that in this sixth cycle, Santa Cruz and Monterey counties are going to need 330, or excuse me, 33,274 new units, which is about three times more than we had in the last cycle. Um, and one of the things that I really want to point out here is that they're looking at some new allocation, allocation methodology that they hadn't in previous cycles. Um, one of the considerations they're using is the number of overcrowded households, uh, which I think is something that we really need to uh, pay attention to because as we just heard from Monarch Services, overcrowded housing is one of the causes of violence. So this isn't just about ensuring that we have enough housing units. This is also about preven preventing violence, et cetera. So that's one of the new things they're considering. Uh, another thing that they're considering is cost-burdened households and ensuring that we have um, uh, a balance of household income distribution. So these are things that hadn't been considered previously when allocating RENA numbers to our region, and eventually it will be allocated by city as well. Um, just based on the overcrowding aspect of it alone, 
Uh, the two counties need 11,410 new units just to alleviate the overcrowding issue that we have. And so I'm bringing this up now, and you'll hear from more about it, um, you know, as, as we move on through the process. Um, but, but I think this is really important for us to, to be aware of as, as we move forward, because um, I'm sure that uh, in the coming years, as we have opportunities to create um, uh, new housing stock in our area, there will be some who are concerned about the density or about the height or about other issues that ultimately we are going to have to face in order to address the fact that we need to uh, diversify not only the uh, income uh, level of, of those uh, housing units, but um, also they're looking at not only just a job housing uh, balance anymore, but a job housing fit. So do, does the kind of housing that we're building match the kind of jobs in our, in our region? And so I just am kind of throwing that out there now, and I'll, I'll speak to it probably a little bit later on, a, on another item in the agenda. But you're going to be hearing a lot from me uh, about this in, in the coming years, quite frankly, um, because this is, um, this is a significant, significantly higher number of housing needs that we have in our region than, than we've ever seen before. So I just wanted to share that. And that's all for me. Thank you, Council Member Peterson. Any other council comments? Okay. Okay, I just have a couple. Um, on September 26th, our um, art height frames are going to be taken down here in Capitola as well as throughout the county, and they will be available for auction at Anna Jean's Anna Jean Cummings Park. Um, I believe it starts at 1 o'clock, and all proceeds will go to the Santa Cruz County Parks and Friends organization. Um, also, if you have not checked your mail recently, you might have gotten something, oh, my background's up, um, that was came from pg e with the logo from Central Coast Community Energy, and it has to do about the peak pricing costs and cost to you as residents um, regarding how and when you use your energy and you have a few options available to you as um, as consumers and so i think it's really important for everyone to take a look at that you should have gotten that in the mail in the last week um, also in addition to that i'm going to be part of a virtual forum called women in leadership um, it's a nonpartisan. Uh, group, or excuse me, a nonpartisan event to get more women involved in leadership and hopefully in government, and that will be taking place in, on October 7th, and so I hope that everyone can sign up for that. And then lastly, on a more somber note, I just want to recognize the, the loss of life um, here in Aptos of our student from Aptos High. Um, it was an unfortunate circumstance uh, that took place and my my condolences go out to the family and the students affected and the entire community this was a loss that absolutely affected us all and so um, my heart is with all of with all of them at this really really trying time in addition to for all of us to keep our um, our ears out for how we can support those families also who are affected by the fires in south in in tahoe um, so there's just a lot of that going on and um, for someone like myself who is an advocate for public service and social services along with my fellow council members here um, i i know that uh, our support is much needed so um, thank you so much and we are going to now move on to I have one more question. Oh, okay. This is for. Oh, you have a comment? Yes. Okay. I do. Thank you very much. It's brief. So um, the other day, I went by and talked to our museum director, our new museum director, and um, you know the introduction was great at our meeting, but I decided to talk with her. I was very impressed with her programs, and um, her background and her familiarity with the area, of course. So. Unless someone would like to pull an item that we would address at the 
end of today's meeting. Would someone like to make a motion to adopt consent item A through C? So moved. Sure. I have a first and we have a second. Go ahead and do a roll call, please. Yes. Uh, Council Member Bertrand. Agree. Council Member Kaiser. Aye. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Story. Aye. Mayor Brooks. Aye. Thank you. Great. This item passes unanimously. We're now moving right along to general government and public hearings. We're going to move to item 9a that is the 720 hill street hotel conceptual review and tonight's recommended recommended action is just to review the proposed hotel size and design review memo from our SCAM design group and provide the applicant or council to provide the applicant with guidance for future development of a hotel at 720 hill street and who am i turning this over to mayor brooks this is um, Director Hurley, that you're turning it over to. Wonderful, thank you so much. Okay, can you see my slides? You can. Okay, great. Uh, this evening before you is a conceptual re review application for 720 Hill Street. A conceptual review uh, uh, provides an opportunity for an applicant to come before the Planning Commission and the City Council and get initial feedback on a, pro on a project before going through the expense of doing the environmental review and um, uh, bringing in their finalized application, especially with larger projects, we usually recommend that um, applicants come in for conceptual review, get feedback, and then bring back an application that works with the initial direction given from the city council. So tonight, uh, the applicant will be seeking direction from the city council for recommendations on this concept that they've come up with for a 42 room hotel at 720 North Street. Uh, it's located in the community commercial zone. Um, the property owner does own the quality inn that's right uh, behind the entry parcel in which they're proposing to develop. Um, one thing to be aware of is this is a transition area for zoning. Um, as you can see in the aerial on the left, and then I have the zoning map to the right. The property is in the community commercial zone, and there are three other zoning districts that are that touch the um, that are adjacent properties to this property. And another item to note is that the property itself is also in our affordable housing overlay. That's the black stripes that you see on top of this property. And within the affordable housing overlay, it was identified as an opportunity site within our housing element. Um, and it projected that up to 61 units could be developed on this site as affordable housing. So, and, and next to it, there's a mixed use site, a multi family, a medium density site, single family homes, and then it is part of the community commercial zoning district. A lot going on in that little corner of the world. But uh, this is a site plan of the existing the quality in, you can see towards the back of the parcel. The, Design places the hotel towards the front, along Crossroads Loop towards the street. The parking will be located in the back and accessed off of the private drive. That's the existing private drive to the Quality Inn. And then circulation is off of Crossroads Loop and uh, through the first story lobby drop off. Again, just noting here uh, the close proximity as we go through these plans um, that in very close proximity to our one single family zoning district, there's five homes that are adjacent to this property. Um, the Planning Commission gave feedback during their review and it should be noted that the, um, the proposal, they've, they've definitely taken into consideration these five homes next door and tried to make it so here on the slide is the view from Crossroads Loop, the front of the hotel. You can see that the lobby is on the first story and then two stories of uh, rooms above that. And then you see the trees on top of the rooftop and that is part of their rooftop deck. This is the 
back of the building, the view from the rear parking lot. Um, from the back of the parking lot, it will look like a two-story building. And you can note there's also an exterior staircase that leads up to that rooftop deck. And this is the south elevation that would be um, towards Hill Street and those single-family homes. The, the centerpiece here is an enclosed staircase, so no windows, so it really uh, protects the privacy of the neighboring homes. In the back portion, this is it's stepped back significantly, about two-thirds back from, the, from this elevation this wall here. So it's really stepped back and away from the, the, uh, the furthest reaching wall on this side. And then there are these the two windows here for a hallway and then the two uh, hotel rooms. But the architect went to, uh, really tried to minimize the impact and protect the privacy of the adjacent neighbors. And on this, this is the north elevation, what would be viewed from the private drive. So you can see that drop-off area for the lobby and the rooftop deck and that staircase and then hotel rooms. We'll quickly go over the floor plans. On the first floor will be the lobby. There will be a dining area for buffet in the morning for breakfast, a small gym and a small meeting room. Again, the drop-off area circulates through that first level. The second level, there's um, just rooms for guests. You can see the enclosed stairs that are close to the single family homes and then the open stairs towards the back. The third level is very much the same as the second. And then here we are on the top of the roof with the rooftop deck. You can see the rooftop deck was um, oriented as far away as possible from the um, single family homes and neighboring residential and really uh, towards the view of the existing hotel and as well as looking down on the commercial area. So there were a couple items within this application or the con concept that do not comply with the zoning code and the applicant will have to fix these prior to coming back in. One is the daylight plane that's required when you're in a residential transition area and there's the section of the um, staircase on the side of the property it exceeds the height limit within the daylight plane, so that that's one modification that will have to be addressed before the, the uh, future application is submitted. And also there's within that transition area a landscaping requirement that um, there must be a 10-foot landscaped area and also uh, a specific requirement for trees every 15 feet. So that was not in their uh, landscape plan, but that's something that we'll have to uh, be included in the future application. And next, I'm going to jump into the design review. We, um, for commercial developments and multifamily developments, the city requires under our new code a, a consultant to perform a design review, an architectural firm. So we hired RRM Design Group and they reviewed this project. I'm going to provide you with some slides with some of the highlights. Um, they First off, I should say they gave the developer a lot, or the uh, architect a lot of credit for a really well-designed project, and the, um, they thought the placement was great. The, um, the rooftop patio location um, was really thoughtful, and uh, also agreed with how the hotel was really sited and oriented towards that crossroads loop road. Um, they did make some recommendations for uh, landscaping along the side, which we've talked about, and then also possibly screening those doors and egress that are uh, on that far end closest to the residential. Um, other recommendations was that the existing sidewalk at the north side of the front drive, they noted that. Um, they really talked about really improving the pedestrian experience so providing adequate signage from the parking in the back through the, lo through the hotel down to the lobby and also incorporating uh, unique paving and pedestrian lighting, enhancing the landscaping um, in the front of the hotel. Also comments on like not just having a simple sidewalk, um, but really having landscaping and softening that experience from the resort down in, you know, um, from the uh, hotel along the street. Um, in terms of articulation, 
they are um, suggested they expand the vertical massing elements within the design uh, to create more balance between the horizontal and vertical elements. So suggesting that there could be a little more um, massing in some areas and more um, design elements. They also talked about the proposed roof line variation is that it's lacking, it's very flat. So looking for an opportunity to vary the height of the roof to enhance the visual interest of the overall project. So um, that helps break down the massing and make it appear a little smaller when you have more articulation in the building. And some more design comments were to enhance the primary entry. So right now the entry is uh, under the roof overhang and there's a lot of glass and different materials. Um, RM was suggesting enhancing this more with a uh, primary entry through an awning or an overhang, possibly wood soffits or an architectural feature. Uh, changing up the windows um, or the color and materials, but really creating that sense of arrival when you get to the hotel and possibly integrating some coastal elements. I think that was the, the wood material, as you can see an example on the bottom of a hotel that has a uh, really nice uh, uh, look for when you arrive at the hotel, the experience you're going to have through the accent. Um, and then they also suggested not only to do this in the front of the building at the lobby, but where the majority of people coming to the hotel will be uh, parking behind it and entering the hotel from the back, to also include some of those uh, defining moments as you enter that back door. So uh, creating that sense of arrival on the back. And more examples of coastal character um, throughout the, the proposal. So when it comes in, they're suggesting that a lot of those accent details that really make a place be shown in those future plans. Um, on the north and east elevation, there are areas that were highlighted in the report that are more blank ele elevations. And they were suggesting to add more detail there, possibly windows, uh, change in color of materials, or even vertical landscaping. On the back of the building where there's an exterior staircase, the RRM suggested either enclosing that or utilizing decorative panels rather than um, the kind of picket railing that's shown. And they provided some examples of what decorative uh, panels could look like in screening. Uh, there was also a suggestion about the windows. There's a lot of windows on hotels, uh, and a repeated pattern. And there wasn't a, a um, close-up window detail, so definitely in the future application, getting more detail on those wood, the, uh, on those windows, and then consider using a higher-end window system with casements or operable windows to enhance the visual interest. There are AC units within each of that. That's what they've highlighted in the blue, and just making sure that those AC units are of high quality and it. Uh, really connects with the overall building architecture. Um, some items that RRM raised as concerns or things that should be included in the future submittal is the site and building light fixtures to understand how the light is going to um, enhance the building as well as protect the neighbors. Um, mechanical equipment, trash receptacles, and utilities should all be screened. Uh, include a sign program because uh, I'm sure signage will be on the building and how it fits in with the architecture, and also what will the modifications to the existing monument sign be, um, and then uh, addressing project sustainability. And uh, they also mentioned in their report really thinking about the future build-out of the site. There's an existing hotel behind the site, and whether in um, a couple decades when they're ready to update or the future hotel in the back, but they've really thought through what are the impacts of this hotel in the front and how they can um, ensure that that can be um, updated adequately and fit into the space. And the city council, the planning commission also made comments to that extent. Um, the planning commission uh, in reviewing this application said that visitor serving land use is appropriate for the site and uh, 
that more they'd like to see more mitigation for the adjacent neighbors so looking at the wall the lighting the noise uh possibly connected uh, having hours of operation for that rooftop deck they suggested incorporating some of the design suggestions um overall they like the design and they thought some of the design suggestions should be added they one comment that several of them made was really that they should integrate the existing hotel with the new hotel and they could do that through landscaping and pathways, also freshening up the existing hotel to complement the new, possibly with new paint, maybe some of those accent materials we talked about previously. Um, and then to consider the pedestrian connectivity to town and to the beach shuttle. So uh, when people arrive at the hotel, having um, providing them with options of how to get down to the beach, we all know how backed up the Esplanade can get and to have a shuttle would be helpful in that area. Uh, they suggested enclosing the stairs in the back of the hotel and uh, comments were made about the windows being high quality and needing to understand how the individual AC units looks within the design. So this evening, the guidance we're looking for is uh, the input on the recommendations made by RRM design group. Also, any recommendations regarding potential impacts to adjacent properties or the public. Uh, because this will require a conditional use permit in front of the planning commission. Um, additional recommendations for the applicant prior to su application submittal, so just any any recommendations you'd like to make at this time would be appropriate. And then do you support the removal of this site from the affordable housing um, elements site inventory list? And to do so, um, we would have to, at the time of the application review, make findings of no net loss um, and we would have, and to make findings of no net loss, we would have to identify that there are other areas in town in which those 61 units could be developed. And I've done some preliminary work on that, and I feel confident that there's adequate sites out there in which 61, the 61 units could be developed. In making those findings, we do not have to update the housing element at that time or the um, we would we would wait until our next uh, RENA cycle and our next uh, housing cycle. So at that time, when we, I think it's in two more years, we would provide, I could provide the initial analysis for findings, but then when we go through updating um, our RENA numbers and our site analysis, we would update the affordable housing overlay to include those additional sites. So that's about two years out. So with that, I am available for questions. Thank you, Katie. Vice Mayor Story. Thank you, Mayor Brooks, and uh, thank you, Katie, for uh, that presentation. Um, my question goes to the, um, I, I guess, last statement you made about the RENA numbers and finding um, alternative um, replacements. Um, and um, I, so if, if this project um, submits its application before 2023, we would only need to find 61 um, replacement units. However, I mean, and based on the report that uh, Councilwoman Peterson gave us, if it's after 2023, we may need to find three times our current number, and so then that task becomes just uh, I would I would think um, you know uh, much greater three times harder um, at that time. So uh, is that a fair statement about um, if we're looking at the application or you're doing this analysis before 2023, the target 61, and you feel that we could meet that. We don't have to anticipate that the RENA numbers are going to probably go up three times, or if not more than three times our current numbers. So you've definitely identified, and Councilor Peterson did earlier, we have a challenge ahead of us um, in our next housing cycle. So we are anticipating the numbers to go up. Um, and that, that will we will be looking for more 
um, sites throughout Capitola, even if this project were not to move forward. Um, however, for this project, we would have to make those no net loss findings, and those findings would be tied to this first step of um, being able to identify different areas in which they, the uh, units could be accommodated. And um, because we allow so much mixed, we allow mixed use throughout our community commercial and our um, regional commercial, I feel confident that we could make those findings, but it does not mean that it's making that task easier in a couple of years when we're going to go through the arena and and re-identifying sites. It, it will be a challenge. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Bertrand. You're muted, John. Council Member, yeah. I'm so used to not being muted when we're in closed session, <laughs> I forget. Um, so it's good to note that um, Mr. Patel is working with the neighbors, and I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that. It, it seemed that many of the issues have been resolved. Um, some of the, um, the plantings maybe along the land uh, border between the hotel and the neighbors have to be addressed, so I agree with that. If you could comment about that, and then I have another question about um, car circulation. Okay, um, so I should mention that Dan Patel, the owner, is on the Zoom meeting, as well as Gwen Jarek, who's the architect. So any um, questions that you'd like to ask them, that would be appropriate, they are here. Um, as far as any revisions that have happened since this application, the conceptual review came in, there have been no revisions just during the Planning Commission discussion. There were really positive talks. Um, when Mr. Patel addressed the Planning Commission of, you know, has consistently worked with his neighbors and plans to consistently work with his neighbors. And um, so if you'd like to hear from him, we, when appropriate, they are available. Okay. Um, so I think one of the concerns is the noise from the outside deck on the roof. And so the first thing I know notice is that it's far away from the neighbor I don't know, and you know, the sound is going to go up and out, but not necessarily up and down. And so the issue of how much that neighbor would hear, um, maybe a potential resolution could be, you know, sound checks. I mean, just to try to get an idea once the thing's built. I have no problem with the closing and opening depending on that sound issue. So maybe sound checks could be part of it. Cause I know it's part of our code anyway. So I don't know if that's going to be talked about. Uh, the other thing is there's that little narrow alley that leads away from the um, post office. So in terms of cars going in and out, I think there was something about signage. We're going to try to take them away from all those interior roads and just focus on hill. That's sort of a question to maybe Steve or Katie, I don't know. but. We, we didn't receive a sign package with this application, so that's something we will look at later on, as well as uh, noise will be evaluated as part of the environmental impact. So. Okay. Um, those are my main que questions at this point. Thank you. Any other questions, Council Member Kaiser? Thank you. Thanks, Katie, as well. Um, so the landscaping, um, was that along the front, like along Hill Street, that um, putting trees every 15 feet, or is that actually butting up against the residential part? It is adjacent to the residential. Okay. That, that okay. requirement, yes. And then I feel like there was, like, mention of a pool, but that's not, they're not yes. putting a pool in. <laughs> It looks like a pool when you look at the site plan, but that's really part of their stormwater plan and the drainage. So okay. uh, just trying to make that grade change work within the hill. Okay, awesome, thank you. Okay, I have just um, a question about, um, uh, I, and I, I saw it on the slides of just like how well they expect this hotel to do. And I know Mr. Patel is on the line. 
Um, I'm just curious about what, how the hotel behind it has done and what they anticipate or how they anticipate this additional hotel will be utilized and if they, you know, what, what the vision there is um, in terms of building another hotel right next to it. I'm just curious. Mr. Patel, are you on the line? And I see your hand raised, so I think you can unmute yourself. Hello, um, Ms. Brooks. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Sorry, what was the question again? Sure. So I'm curious what um, enticed you to build an additional hotel right next to the other one, just as a basic question. And I haven't recently looked at the numbers of how this hotel that's already built has been doing. And I'm just curious, do you, is the vision that building this other one will make more people come i'm just wondering about the necessity of another hotel in in the, within the city and what your thoughts were on that um it, yes ma'am um so when we took over the uh it was actually a capitola Inn when we took over the uh quality Inn. um the revenue on that property was only six hundred and fifty thousand dollars when we took over um in 2019 we took that to 1.8 million dollars so that was roughly about two hundred thousand dollars to the city of Capitola um, in, in a year. Um, that will bring people to Capitola, and we're giving them two options. Basically, there's an option for a lower, uh, you know, like a mid-scale property, and this will be a little bit of a higher-end property. It will be a boutique hotel, so basically like a higher-end. Um, it'll just bring in more people. It, it's a uh, win-win for city of Capitola. A um, lot of um, talking to, um, I guess, Doug, we, who owns the um, the Lomax, um, the office building and the restaurant and all that. Um, they're very anxious. Um, the old owner, the original owner was supposed to put um, 72 units on that proper on the on those two lots right there um, so I think it it's it's feasible um, it, it'll it'll bring in people um, the uh, Shadowbrook uh, owner called me yesterday um, he was he thought it was a very good idea to bring in the hotel with a meeting space over there so a lot, lot of good feedback from from my neighbors Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and move to, um, unless council has any other questions for Mr. Patel or anyone else at this time. We'll move on to public comment. So I'll open this up to public comment. If you'd like to make a comment, send an email now to public comments at ci.capitola.ca.us. Or to speak, please raise your hand now by clicking on reactions then clicking raise hand in your Zoom application. Or by dialing, Chloe, is it star nine or star six? Did we find out? To be honest with you, Mayor Brown, Maybe. I think it depends on the, the version of the app that the person is using. Okay. So try both. All right, so either, all right, so try both if you have called in, council um, or to our public, if you've called in, that's dialing star nine or star six. Our moderator will unmute you and you will have up to three minutes to speak. Mayor Brooks, we have Gwen Jarek uh, asking to speak. Gwen, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Have you unmuted? It's so tricky. I'm guessing you are attempting to try. We'll give you a second to try to figure it out. Space work works. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? We can. Okay. I apologize. I was hitting the wrong button. It's okay. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, Mayor Brooks, Vice Mayor Story. Um, and council members uh, Bertrand, Kaiser, and Peterson. I'm Gwen Jerick. I'm the architect on the project um, and also representing the owner this evening. I just wanted to thank you for bringing this to
to a preliminary review, which helps us in our planning phase, um, obviously, to make it a little more efficient moving forward with all the comments. Um, the project, I think overall, the Planning Commission was received quite positively. The feedback um, and the support was positive. Um, we received a few comments um, from um, a few neighbors, and um, they were some minor issues, and we look forward to working with the neighborhood and had planned to do our own outreach independently. Um, and we, you know, the ownership is very interested in being a good neighbor, so he wants to do the right thing. Um, the concerns of light pollution and privacy from the parking lot, which uh, was brought up in the uh, meeting, uh, will be addressed. A lighting design and wall design that meets the neighbor's needs, as well as those the city and the hotel, will be presented to all stakeholders for feedback. Um, also, uh, pertaining to the two hotels um, and landscape, and also the question about upgrading the other hotel, the ownership is actively looking. He's already done some interior uh, renovations to the hotel just recently. It's just finishing up and has planned to upgrade the landscaping as well as um, the exterior with new paint scheme and things like that. So it will be upgraded. Um, to kind of enhance the overall property, um, you know, in a pleasant way for all of the all of the uh, ownership, uh, the neighbors, and also for the people who will be staying there. And um, if you have any questions, any other questions, happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Okay, so we'll bring this back to council. Um, this evening is our opportunity to provide feedback and guidance to staff and to the uh, and um, anyone w would like to start here, Councilmember Kaiser, and then to Councilmember Peterson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I am really interested in this project moving forward. Um, I did like a lot of the recommendations that were brought on by RM, um, enclosing the stairways, I think would also kind of help with the noise aspect as well. Um, definitely trying to work with the neighbors and making sure that there's at least some type of agreement um, and commonality between either a wall or landscaping that would help minimize sound. Um, and then I really like the idea of either a shuttle or some type of um, bike transportation provided by the hotel itself just to minimize the in and out um, it, from the parking lot noise-wise and everything like that and just the traffic-wise on that little loop. Um, Hill Street, as we know, can be <laughs> people like to speed up it. <laughs> it's not awesome all the time, but yeah, just working um, with the neighborhood is um, what I would like to see happen. But I'm kind of excited about it. I think I think Mr. Patel is right. I think that this would add um, obviously to our TOT tax income, which is great, but along with more opportunities for guests and. Um, maybe enhance that area a little bit as well. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Peterson. Thank you, Mayor Brooks. Thank you for the uh, presentation today. And um, everything that, that I'm about to uh, speak to was, was already mentioned in the presentation. So I just want to briefly um, emphasize the things that I, I think are, are good ideas here. And, and one that I saw was the consideration of public art. Um, at the crossroads loop, I think there's always um, it's always great to have opportunities for public art. Um, additionally, the landscaping additions, the enhanced softening at the sidewalk, I think that's going to be really important. Um, and then finally, uh, or or additionally, the idea of um, I'd really like to encourage the owners to continue with considerations for future build out plans for an update of the existing hotel or freshening the existing hotel in the, in the meantime. Um, and then also just uh, echoing what Council Member Kaiser said regarding uh, the importance of either a bike share or a shuttle or something of that sort to get people down into the village. Um, but otherwise, I'm looking forward to seeing how this project progresses. Thank you. 
Thank you, Vice Mayor Story. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Burks. Um, you know, I, I want to start by saying um, there, there's a lot to like about this project. Um, you know, it, the, the property is properly zoned for this use. It's consistent with the current use. And I think potentially it could be a great um, um, asset to the community. Um, but with that said, and because I have limited time, um, I'm going to focus on what I consider, you know, the issues and, and try to give the feedback um, as requested in the staff report. Um, and I'll start by um, saying that, um, uh, of course, all the, um, you know, the community commercial zoning um, development standards um, need to be met. Um, most of them are, but the issues with the staircase and the daylight plane uh, need to be resolved. Um, and the landscape buffer um, um, adjacent to the R1 zone uh, needs to be established. I, I don't know that a variance would be, uh, or um, this project would be eligible for a variance on those issues. So uh, I would encourage you to um, try to redesign to uh, meet those uh, development standards. Um, concerning the design review criteria, um, and that's section 17.120.070. Um, I just, you know, in reviewing it, I want to emphasize that you use this language like shall evaluate applications to ensure criteria are satisfied. Um, that the city would do that, and and it and uh, these criteria must be satisfied where they're applicable. Um, and to the extent that the RRM design group recommendations, those are based upon the section 17.120.070 design review criteria. Um, and to that extent, I endorse them wholeheartedly. Um, there are a, a, a few of them that I want to particularly uh, speak to. And one is concerning um, the um, overall design uh, of the building itself. Um, one of the design criteria are several of them um, that um, the design must uh, com comply with uh, the community character, it be consistent with uh, our neighborhood compatibility, uh, it be consistent with the historical character of new structures and the massing and scaling should be consistent with the surrounding uh, neighborhoods um, um, and the architectural style um, and the architectural and visual um, interest. And, um, you know, I, I just do not feel that this particular design, uh, as it's presented in a two-dimensional way, meet those criteria. Um, it, in my view, it's, it's not compatible even with the existing hotel that is there, um, and especially not with the, uh, the rest of the neighborhood or the other structures that are uh, in that neighborhood, the other commercial structures that are in that neighborhood. Um, and, um, you know, Capitola, um, in this general plan, um, you know, our goal is to maintain our small town feel um, and our coastal village um, um, a feel in our community. Um, and I just don't feel that uh, this particular design at this stage um, meet those design review criteria. And I would like to maybe point, and I know Mr. Patel's probably uh, very familiar with the Fairfield Inn on 41st Avenue, uh, but, um, you know, I would like to put that out, as, I think, as an example of an architectural design um, that um, fits in with our community. Um, you know, and specifically, I, you know, where RRM identifies that there's just too much horizontal uh, flat lines along the roof line um, and um, no architectural interests along the roof line so I would encourage you to um, go back and, and look at that. Um, 
and maybe bring us back a design that would be more in keeping uh, with um, um, those uh, criteria. Um, on some of the other elements, um, um, there's um, the lack of a sustainability uh, features of the project, and hopefully when it comes back, there will be those will be addressed. Um, and a conceptual landscape plan um, for you know the in, in both properties, um, so that it would tie them together. Um, and um, concerning um, the circulation, uh, traffic circulation, um, I would like to see um, the traffic being directed, uh, or either coming in or going out. Uh, toward Bay Avenue and hopefully avoiding Hill Street, uh, where, um, as we know, already know, we already have issues with speeding on Hill Street and, you know, and, uh, people tend to speed, um, as they either go down or, or up it. Um, and, um, And concerning, oh, there's been several comments made about the beach shuttle, but um, um, and providing or uh, having, uh, you know, electric scooters or bikes, I think would be a great idea. Uh, we may be implementing uh, such a plan. You know, the city runs a beach shuttle, so hopefully um, um, the um, the hotel can, you know, work with us, partner with the city. Uh, to uh, try to share the cost of a shuttle from the hotel you know, to the village and to the beach, uh, and maybe even potentially the mall. Um, on the, um, um, I, I guess, process, um, I was very pleased to hear uh, when uh, Ms. Derek uh, mentioned that you're going to be doing your own outreach to the neighborhoods. I think that is a great and an important uh, step in order to get in front of uh, you know the neighbors and address their concerns. Um, you know, there's been you know some requests for a higher wall um, uh, at um, adjacent to the R1 uh, property uh, to have no truck parking near the R1 property uh, and a limit on hours of the deck use. And so, but I think if you do reach out and work with the neighbors. Uh, you can sort out those issues. Um, and I think finally on the, um, uh, we've been asked whether we um, would accept um, the removing of the affordable housing overlay. Um, and um, I, I would say that I would, because I think currently we could probably find alternatives. Um, but I think that that's a function of how quickly you get the application in. Um, it, after 2023, I think it could get uh, much more problematic. Um, and uh, let me just quickly check my notes before I sign off. And uh, um, but I think I covered it all. Um, so thank you. I do appreciate uh, you giving us this opportunity to uh, comment on the project. And I think we all very much look forward to working with you further. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Council Member Bertrand. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a few notes. Um, first of all, I, I like the look in general right now of the project. And I also like the fact that the owner um, wants to take input from the neighbors. And he's obviously at this meeting to take input from us. So I appreciate that time that you're giving to this project, which I assume you want to be the best it can be. So I'm not an architect, I'm not a designer, but these recommendations from our consultant got me thinking and the whole idea of articulation, bulk management, and giving few features that make the front interesting strikes me as something very worthwhile because this will be a permanent structure and you want it to be appealing. So I don't know necessarily how to use different materials and different um, aspects of how you make the features fit together, but I was very pleased with our library. And I learned a lot about how 
the material on the outside adds a lot to the interest of the building, how the roof line adds a lot to the interest that the public takes in the building. And obviously it's not a library, but I could see how these are very important considerations. And right now it's sort of, you know, my job, marketing manager and all that, traveled to see many different hotels and you know, sometimes the fronts look all the same. And I would hope that um, this hotel takes into account that we'd like something that looks unique. And as Sam's story mentioned, sort of reminds folks that this is a small town on the coast of California, the first resort town in California, as I've been told by reading history books. There's a history here. So if this building could remind people that this is a, a sea-facing town, we take a lot of pride that we're on the Monterey Bay and the issues there with um, animal life. You know, there's a whole, whole host of aspects that could be probably tied into what you present to the public when you design the outside of the building. So art's really important to me. Um, I think um, Kristen mentioned the art at the entrance. I agree that this is an important thing to consider. Maybe even art on the outside. Um, I don't mean big, huge murals, but aspects that um, have an artistic touch on the front and sides of the building. I think one side is a lot more plainer than the other, but obviously the one facing hill that you would see from Bay, for instance, has more importance to me. Um, we have local meetings here on economic development in Monterey Bay, and I've gone to a number of them. And one thing that keeps coming up is the lack of meeting space. And um, one reason why I bring this up is not because <laughs> we don't have much meeting space in, in our hotels of various large sizes, but um, it also means that during non-summer times, you would probably be able to draw more people because you can offer meeting space. And sometimes that is a consideration if you want to balance out um, the number of rentals, excuse me, of customers all, all over the year. The back staircase, um, that's an issue you're going to be working out because it, it is non-conforming. But I agree that it has to be done. Uh, I think the um, consultant offered about um, covering it on the outside, maybe matching the vertical striping and the wood uh, that's used for that. Um, it was mentioned about the shuttle. Um, one thing I'd like to add is one of our concerns when the discussion about a hotel downtown at a former theater site came up is the fact that um, we don't want a lot of cars going in and out and affecting the normal people that come through the village because it's really a freeway at certain times of the year. So a shuttle might help. Another reason why it might help is because um, people are kind of far away from the beach and they may want to go down the beach instead of walking the seven or eight blocks. I haven't counted. So that might be a bonus to you. And we do have a shuttle program and you can participate in that. And um, that might be a benefit to your customers. Um, I brought up earlier the need to do signage and such on Hill Street. Um, I agree with Margot. Hill Street is, is a dangerous street. People just, it's a roller coaster. They wanna go down that as fast as they can to get the bay. And uh, there's been a number of problems um, so I think that's an important consideration. Um, I don't know how to handle that, but um, going directly to Bay uh, in that little alleyway, so to speak, that goes in front of um, the post office, but that's on private property. So I don't know how that could be affected. Those are my comments. In general, I like the plan. Um, I think the suggestions of our consultant will be reviewed by you and consulting with our planning department and a lot there that meets um, the level of good consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand.
I'm just going to wait for you to mute yourself so it doesn't echo. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so the guidance requested we requested this evening is just uh, do I agree with the recommendations made by RS RRM design group? I do. I humbly disagree with Council uh, Vice Mayor's story. I actually really like the design. I think it's fresh and um, and it does tie in to to our community in a in a fresh way and a relevant way. Uh, do I have any comments or recommendations regarding potential impacts to the adjacent properties or the public? I do. There's just a couple here. We have, for the most part, at least for as long as I've been elected, received multiple um, emails and uh, about concerns about the speed and uh, the drivers on Hill Street. And um, I think this is something that's important for actually the city to really focus on in partnership with the hotel property managers. And I hope that we can remedy that um, as soon as possible, even before we break ground and to come up with a plan. So I'd like to see that happen. Um, I do want to stress the importance, I know it's been said by most, all council members, is to stress the need to tie in the other property to this property. Um, I know that you uh, that it's, it's a good idea to make them look different, but also uh, maybe not so different that it looks sticks out like a sore thumb. So um, I really liked the recommendations in terms of landscaping and just the fresh uh, fresh paint and really just making the other one not look so uh, sad compared to the new one in, in an easier way to say things. Um, safety is a really big concern of mine. You mentioned these outside stairways, and I think it was person, uh, the the commission um, that suggested closing that gate or doing something. I don't know if that's a need, a necessity to have these outside stairs and what some other options may be. Does it make sense to have people go to the rooftop deck from the outside? Maybe it's about going in and going up. Um, as a different way of accessing the rooftop deck. The last thing I would add um, is about uh, is that I would hope that the hotel adopts eco-friendly initiatives. Um, that's really important to me, things such as um, the cleaning products they use, the, bot uh, the water alternatives, the energy conservation, water conservation, um, all of these things and, uh, to introduce all these sustainable hotel practices are really important to me as well. And I hope that they look at that um, as they uh, redesign or uh, take all of our, our comments into consideration. Um, the third question was, does, do we have additional recommendations for applicants? I think I've said that. And do I generally re uh, support the removal of the site from the affordable housing element? I do at this time, thanks to um, Katie, you saying that there are alternative uh, sites. I don't know if that looks like um, if when we can discuss that further, or maybe we can take that offline, but um, I'd like to learn a little bit more about that just as, a, as an aside. So um, I believe everyone has gotten what they needed from council tonight. And if there are no other staff comments or questions or council comments, I think we can move on to our next item. Everyone looks good. Katie, you have what you need. Yes, thank you very much. Very helpful. Oh. Okay, wonderful. So now we're gonna move on to our next item uh, B here, and that's affordable housing nexus and feasibility study. And again, tonight is to accept the presentation on the affordable housing nexus study and feasibility study, and again, to direct staff to utilize information from the studies to do the three following things, to revise the on-site inclusionary requirements in the IHO update, to update the in-lieu housing fees, and to establish affordable housing impact fee levels. So we have our work cut out for us tonight, Katie. And is this your item? It is. Thank you very much. Um, this evening, I have uh, Jake Craner and Darren Smith of EPS. Um, and they are the ones that put together our great uh, nexus study and feasibility analysis. And they're going to lead the presentation. 
Um, we also have Megan Burke from our attorney's office, um, who's been very instrumental in helping with the conversation and guiding us through the process legally. Um, and she'll be presenting a couple slides and then I'll be uh, wrapping it up at the end with options. So um, welcome, Darren and Jake and Megan. Thank you very much. Should I go ahead and share my screen? Yes, please. Thank you, Jake. Uh, again, my name is Darren Smith. I am a managing principal with the consulting firm of Economic and Planning Systems, and we have been working on affordable housing policies throughout California for uh, nearly 40 years. The firm was founded in 1983, and we've done uh, lots of these kinds of studies all over the state and, and really all over the country, and are pleased to be here with you this evening to talk about our findings and what it might mean for your community. The work that we were retained to do uh, was to look at the relationship between housing growth, uh, the, the construction of new market rate housing, both on the ownership side and the rental side, and also the expansion of uh, existing homes, because we know that's been a, a trend in Capitola, and understand how, uh, how the economics of new construction uh, affects the demand for affordable housing in your community. Um, by and large, the homes being built are market rate and for upper income households, uh, and that has effects that ripple through your community. And so we were talking a little bit about the Nexus study that we've done. Uh, we've also looked at what other comparable jurisdictions around you have in terms of their inclusionary housing requirements and other uh, ways that they're addressing affordable housing. And finally, we wanted to test the feasibility of various fees and inclusionary requirements, uh, understanding that these things tend to, whether it's requiring uh, affordable units in a new project or requiring a fee uh, to be paid by those projects, it does affect the economics of such projects, and we want to understand the, uh, the level of impact that such requirements would have on new construction. As a reminder, the city's current policy is that on the for sale side, one out of every seven units, um, if, it has, if it is a project with at least seven units, uh, one out of every seven units must be provided at, a, at what's called the median income level uh, that's set at the county level, 100% uh, of that median income. And if you have a project that is supposed to provide, for example, 2.3 affordable units, um, then they must require must provide the two units and then pay a fee for the additional 0.3 fractional units. And that fee, as currently uh, adopted by the city, is that the rental developments, uh, well, on the for sale side, the, the fee is $10 a square foot. Um, and if it is a rental development, there is no actual on-site requirement that they provide units, but rather uh, rental developments are asked to pay a fee of $6 per square foot. And if it's an addition to an existing home, um, that addition, as long as it increases the home size by at least 50%, um, the additional square feet uh, are asked to pay $2.50 per square foot. So that's your existing policy. And just to set context here, we always like to show a slide that uh, shows the income levels that we're talking about. These are set by the state, by HCD, and they are set uh, county by county throughout the state based on uh, locally prevailing income levels. So the median income here, we're showing it for a, a household of three people, and it does vary by household size. But the median income in the next to last uh, row here is $99,000 per year. Uh, that's the, the middle. Um, and low income uh, is set at 95,600. Moderate income is set at 118.8. Very low income is still $60,000 a year. So um, even the, the very low income folks that we are talking about um, to reach that level of income requires essentially two plus uh, full-time jobs making minimum wage. So these are working households that we're talking about. 
the way that we do a nexus study, uh, and we've done these, and firms like ours have done these throughout the state, um, the first thing that we look at is how much it costs to build affordable housing versus how much a household can afford to pay. And so we estimated the cost of acquiring land and doing construction and so forth uh, for a rental apartment in Capitola. Uh, and we compared those costs, which are in excess of half a million dollars to construct a new apartment building or con a new apartment unit um, in Capitola. But we compare those to what folks can afford to pay at various income levels to determine if there's a subsidy required for the construction of such units. And we did determine that uh, at certainly at very low and low income levels, there is a subsidy required to produce affordable units. Um, the next thing we look at is the demand for affordable housing. And here we, uh, the idea is that as new households come to town into market rate housing units, um, they are bringing with them spending and that spending creates new jobs in the community. And many of those new jobs that are serving the growing population are in retail and services and uh, make lower income wages and thus are increasing demand for affordable housing. Um, and so then we look at for any given housing type and price uh, because it is affected by the price of those units um, with higher income or higher priced housing having higher income households that spend more money and thus create more jobs. We look at the, uh, the number of jobs that they are generating through their uh, spending and how many of those jobs would require affordable housing and what the overall financial gap is to provide that affordable housing to come up with an overall cost of uh, housing demand. And then we divide that essentially by the size of the units that are uh, creating that demand to come up with a fee per square foot. So that's a little complicated and I'll be happy to take any number of questions that you may have, um, but hopefully you've each had an opportunity to review the uh, Nexus study and other materials that we've provided and it spells it out a little bit more. The results of our analysis on the rental side, um, we looked at studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms and estimated the value that each of those units would have, the rents that they would command in the, in the marketplace, uh, the incomes of the households that would be occupying those, develop, those uh, rental units if they are built. And again, through the spending that they would do in your community, estimated the number of jobs that they would create and the amount of subsidies that would be required uh, to provide housing for those jobs. We estimated that um, the total fees per square foot do vary based on the size of the units, but range uh, in excess of $45 a square foot. Um, and we also estimated the number of jobs, as I mentioned, that are uh, generated um, so in a, for example, 100 unit uh, project um, of all studio apartments, a 100 unit project would generate demand for 14 additional affordable units. A uh, 100 unit one bedroom uh, project would generate demand for 20 affordable units and so on. And so you, you see these relationships here. Um, but the upshot again for that one was we're looking at a nexus-based fee that is a maximum that could be supported legally uh, in excess of $45 a square foot. We did the same kind of analysis on the for sale side, looking here at different prices of units, um, because again, the price of the unit determines the income of the household that would occupy it, and that income generates the spending that generates the jobs. And here uh, we estimate that the uh, fee per square foot would be in excess of $40. So around $43 is the minimum and it actually goes up from there. And again, we've estimated that there's essentially a, a minimum of 13.5% uh, inclusionary requirement if you wanted to draw that uh, parallel that would be substantiated by the nexus analysis. Um, now that is different than the feasibility analysis that we will be speaking to a, a little later. But again, on a nexus basis, we are estimating that you could legally uh, justify a fee in excess of $43 a square foot 
on new for sale construction. We also looked at what other communities around you have in terms of their inclusionary housing requirements. Um, this is a table or a, a slide of rental uh, requirements. Capitola is on the left-hand side, and because you don't actually require the construction of rental uh, inclusionary units in your rental developments, uh, we show you as a zero there. As a reminder, we did indicate that you have a fee set at $6 per square foot uh, that is essentially in lieu of providing units within project. What you see from these other communities um, in your county and others surrounding you, that it's typical that the community will have anywhere from, in this case, a 12 to 20% inclusionary requirement with some mix of incomes uh, associated with that. We have any anywhere from uh, units that are to be provided to uh, holders of Section 8 vouchers, uh, as in, is in the case of Watsonville, up through very low income, low income, and in some cases, median and moderate income households. Um, so again, the, kind of the going rate is in that 15 to 20% range and often with a mix of household incomes associated with it. Um, but again, that is what the standards are, but it doesn't necessarily mean that those standards are in fact feasible. And so we'll be speaking to that in a moment as well. On the for sale side, we see a similar relationship. Capitola has a 15% requirement. The one in seven uh, is your current requirement at median income. It's a little bit different than 15%, but we're showing it here in that way. And again, the range from other communities tends to be in that 15 to 20% range with, in many cases, a mix of incomes at uh, low and moderate incomes for the for sale uh, requirements of inclusionary housing. So again, you see that there's uh, a number of communities around you that have these policies uh, and you are sort of in the, in the sweet spot in terms of that 15%. All right, uh, so now we're going to take a look at the feasibility analysis. Um, just a quick reminder there, and already touched on this. The Nexus results indicate uh, the maximum fee or inclusionary requirement that can be adopted. However, uh, these results typically uh, cannot reasonably be absorbed by new development. Um, fees of that magnitude would most likely kill, um, kill a project. So our, feas our feasibility analysis uh, seeks to determine what level of fee or inclusionary requirement uh, can reasonably be absorbed uh, by developers while still allow, allowing them to achieve a reasonable return? And we'll get into uh, what that return is here in a little bit. Um, on the rental side, uh, we looked at four scenarios. Uh, the current ordinance, so $6 a square foot. Uh, we looked at uh, if there was to be no fee or inclusionary uh, requirement, so just all market rate units, no fee. Uh, then we took a look at the maximum nexus base fee, uh, so that's about $55 per square foot. Um, I should, should mention uh, this, uh, this analysis looked at a development that is assumed to be an average of uh, two bedroom units. Um, so at that uh, number of bedrooms, it's about $55 per square foot. And then we also looked at the nexus base inclusionary requirement, which comes out to about 20%, uh, most of which are priced at um, uh, levels affordable to very low income households. Um, so the um, necessary return, uh, we estimate that developers would require in order to undertake such a project uh, is about, we believe, 5.25% yield on cost. So that's their annual net operating income over uh, the cost to build the units. Um, really, I mean, all you really need to look at here is the, if there were to be no inclusionary requirement or fee, they still don't even make 5%. So it's going to be very tough um, for a developer to undertake uh, such, such a project in Capitola. In other jurisdictions, uh, the development economics may be uh, a little bit different, or you might find a developer for whatever reason is willing to take on the risk of such a project uh, for a lower return. But this is uh, based on our conversations with developers um, in in the wider area. This 
this return is, is pretty typical. So if you can't make the project work with no inclusionary RFP, it is obviously difficult to make it work, um, even with the inclusionary ordinance of $6 a square foot and certainly very difficult with the results of uh, the Nexus study. So uh, on the four sale unit side, uh, we took a look at uh, a few additional um, scenarios. Uh, obviously the current ordinance, so about 15% of units uh, being affordable to households at the median, uh, median area income. Uh, we looked at if the project, the project were charged the existing fee with no inclusionary requirement. So all units were charged a $10 uh, fee per square foot. Uh, again, we looked at no inclusionary fee, uh, no inclusionary requirement or fee, and then the maximum nexus space fee, which is about $44 a square foot in this case. Again, I should mention the average household size here is assumed to be uh, about 1,800 square feet, um, and Capitola uh, recent sales indicate that uh, single-family for sale units sell for about $800 a square foot. So this um, these units were assuming to cost around 1.4 million. Uh, so this $44 per square foot fee is the maximum allowable charge and is levied on those 1,800 square feet. Uh, we also looked at the maximum uh, nexus based inclusionary requirement, which is again around 20%. And then, a um, bit of a spoiler here, these other, um, at least, well, the existing fee does allow for um a, an achievable return so if, if that's the case then uh, there is a maximum feasible fee or um, an inclusionary requirement that can be um, supported by existing development economics uh, however um, the existing requirement of 15 percent we do not believe um, to be uh, feasible generally it comes out to about 12.3%, uh, whereas we see um, developers in, in the area and uh, statewide really uh, require a profit margin of about 18%. So that's 18% um, of cost. Uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so the, the amount they sell for um, is 18% higher than uh, the cost will be. You know. Um, so the existing fee, uh, in addition to the no inclusionary requirement or fee, uh, are both feasible. They allow for uh, profit margins of above 20%, so that's a very healthy return, we believe. The maximum nexus fee and nexus-based inclusionary requirement uh, are not feasible, we uh, believe, though the maximum nexus-based fee is actually a bit above uh, the current ordinance. And then we took a look at these four scenarios where um, the fee is feasible, so that comes out to a little under $25 per square foot. And then we looked at inclusionary requirements that would be affordable to um, moderate or median or low incomes. So if the inclusionary requirement was 8% moderate, we believe the developer would be able to uh, achieve about an 18% profit margin. Um, that's a little bit lower for um, households at uh, area median income because that's a little bit less um, than moderate. And again, low income is less than median, so uh, the maximum feasible uh, inclusionary requirement for low income is just 6%. Um, so a few broad policy implications of the feasibility analysis. Um, as we discussed earlier, the maximum fees and inclusionary requirements uh, reported by the next studies appear to be infeasible. However, Increasing for sale uh, fee from $10 per square foot to $25 a square foot does appear to allow developers to achieve uh, the required return. Uh, while the existing um, for sale inclusionary requirement of 15% does not appear to be feasible, um, inclusionary requirement of 6% for low income, 7% for median income, or 8% for moderate income, uh, they do appear to be feasible. Um, Again, rental developments appear to face feasibility challenges even uh, with the current $6 per square foot fee or even with no fee. And uh, fees on home additions uh, are borne by homeowners 
uh, with different financial objectives than developers. Um, so we we don't see any any real need for an increase over the current two dollars and fifty cent per square foot feet for home additions over fifty percent. So now I'm going to pass it over to Megan Burke to talk a little bit about the legal considerations. Yeah. Good evening. So under recent housing legislation, the city cannot adopt new affordable housing inclusionary requirements or affordable housing fees unless they are feasible. So what that means for the city here is that you could increase your current fee per square foot up to $25 because that's what is shown to be feasible under the study. Um, you could also retain your existing 15% inclusionary requirement for projects of seven units or more, or you could reduce that requirement any um, below the 15% down to the amount that is feasible or wherever you would like to put it. Um, and as part of that inclusionary requirement, you could also give developers the option of um, either dedicating the affordable units or paying an in lieu fee, and that in lieu fee could go up to the $25 per square foot that's shown to be feasible. Um, for rental uh, developments, that means that you can retain the $6 per square foot fee that you currently have, or you could reduce or eliminate that fee. Um, and but you could not adopt a new rental housing inclusionary requirement because that would be a new, more restrictive requirement. And the feasibility study shows that um, those inclusionary requirements would not be feasible for rental housing. Okay, and so now I'll jump in and talk about um, co kind of combine this with an example of scenarios. And these are. The scenarios that you're going to see me present are the three options that really the city could incorporate into our um, inclusionary housing ordinance. So the first scenario is our current IHO where there's an inclusionary requirement of one per seven, which um, in this example, I, kind of, I based it on Terra Commons off of 38. Those units were about 1,500 square feet in size. There were, I think, maybe 11 units, but I bumped it up to 20 so you could see how many units under these three scenarios that uh, capital would get. So um, 20 units, 1,500 square feet. Under our current IHO, we would get two inclusionary units. And then with the fee at $10 a square foot, um, for the remaining six units, we, the city would collect $90,000. If we took this scenario and increased the fee, so went from the $10 to the $25, um, you keep the inclusionary at one per seven, or we keep referring to that as 15%, it's a little bit less than 15%, but the one per seven, you'd still get your two inclusionary units, and then the fee collected by the city would go up to $225,000. Next slide. Um, to make this scenario feasible, the, the $25 fee, We've already learned that the one per seven, the current ordinance isn't quite feasible. So the way in which we could make this feasible is we could also add an option to scenario two saying one per seven, $25, or they can pay um, an in lieu fee for all toward, that would go towards the 20 units. And that would bring in $750,000. So that's really making this option feasible. It would fit within our feasibility study. Um, and then the third scenario is um, that last item that Jake had talked about that uh, we could produce if we could require um, low income on site and it could be up to 6% which means one unit out of every 17. So that's a uh, major difference from our one for, one for every seven. And in that scenario, we'd get one unit as well as three units that would uh, pay a fee at $25 a square foot, bringing in $112,000. So those are really the three scenarios. If you could go forward one more time. Um, I, I also want to mention under the scenario two, Megan just, stated that we also have some flexibility there that if the city didn't want to continue with our one per seven requirement based on the 
um, the facts that came out of this feasibility analysis. You could um, make that less restrictive, so it could be one per eight, one per nine, one per ten, knowing that um, scenario two, our, our current inclusionary really uh, is not, was found to not be feasible. So those are your three options. Next slide, please. And then I'll talk about rental. So uh, Jake had explained how under the rental scenario, none of the options we have are more feasible. The current ordinance um, doesn't have a, the correct amount of return. Um, so with the rental options is we could keep our rental assets at $6 a square foot um, and no inclusionary, or we could lower the requirement and go uh, decrease it from $6 a square foot to say $5 a square foot. Um, or we could eliminate the fee altogether. Um, and uh, those are the options. Next slide, please. So I've got two slides on recommendations. This first slide is for the recommendation for an in lieu and impact fees. So based on the study, um, we believe that the in lieu and impact fee should be $25 a square foot. It's showing that at $25 a square foot, that's feasible for a developer to uh, get their return on investment. Um, we're, we're also recommending that you keep the $2.50 square foot fee for home additions over 50%. We found that uh, that also is feasible. And in terms of the rental housing, we um, this is more of a soft recommendation. I'm giving you options within <laughs> a recommendation, but we should either keep it as is today or consider lowering it to bring in some funding. Um, and then you, of course, have the other option of eliminating it altogether. But so those are the, those recommendations. And next I'll talk about the recommendation for the inclusionary requirement. So for inclusionary, um, I would suggest keeping our inclusionary at 15%, but in, and, and have the $25 uh, fee applied, but then include that option where they could fee out. So within the scenario that with 20 units, they could say no on-site units, and then the city would collect the, the three quarters of a million dollars, which could then go towards a project for development. So um, that is the recommendation. The other option you have is to reduce the inclusionary requirements um, to the feasibility levels, and that is supported by the feasibility analysis. So including, um, you could create options that the developer can either produce moderate on site or low, and moderate would come in at 8% or one unit per 12, or low at 6% at one unit per 17. So those are the recommendations, and we're all here for any questions. That was great, Katie. Thanks so much, everyone, for your presentation. We'll take this to council for questions. Vice Mayor Story. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Katie, on your recommendations, uh, you're saying we could have, um, and this is the, um, in lieu of the 15% inclusionary. Uh, it would be in the example 750000 and you said that we could use that money for another project, but I mean, you don't have a lot of options for projects in Capitola. Um, so I'm just wondering what, what is the feasibility of us being able to use those funds uh, for other projects? And I guess my other, I mean, I have an overall question of, of our affordable housing funding. It sounds like we would be building up a funding bank. What are the kinds of, of projects that are, how could we use it to produce more affordable housing? So um, you're absolutely correct that land is limited in Capitola. So in taking that into consideration, um, as projects redevelop, there could be opportunities for um, for a developer to possibly provide the city with a portion of their land, and um, and then we would work with a nonprofit uh, housing developer to produce 
housing on the site and take advantage of grant opportunities that are out there. But also, typically, uh, the city would come to the project with some money in the bank. So, um, I um, so ha utilizing those funds and also uh, redevelopment projects could also, you know, Bay Avenue Senior Center. We are the senior housing that was I think at first a redevelopment project and then um, and in which the city part brought money forward as well as utilizing home funds but um, on some of our larger projects it would be nice it would be ideal to almost get a land dedication so say at the mall if they were to give us a small land dedication that we could partner with a nonprofit and produce some affordable housing on the site and there, there's Quite a few larger parcels along 41st Avenue. We are limited. We are a two square mile city, but um, there are some possibly some opportunity sites out there. So, if, if I may have a follow up, um, Katie, if we had a, um, a housing fund, and um, could we buy into an exclusionary ordinance? Can I mean, if, like, yeah, let me, um, if, um, let's say we wanted to um, have an exclusionary ordinance where um, it was moderate at 8%. Um, but if we came in with a housing fund, could we supplement that and say, well, we're, we're going to chip in, but we want you to build a unit that's low income? Um, is that feasible? Yeah, our, our housing fund allows us to assist with housing projects and build units. So I do think that is feasible. If if there was a developer that came in and you wanted, um, knowing the infeasibility is what, what you're I think, hitting on, could the city be a partner in that and utilize some of that those funds to make? Yes produce more housing on a site and I think we could I don't think if we have an inclusionary ordinance um, they would be required if they're if they're opting into the inclusionary ordinance they would be required to produce what's in the inclusionary but if, okay. if we wanted them to make it more affordable I think we could fill that gap to get there um, that goes beyond the inclusionary ordinance and just one other example for you also is like 600 Park Avenue. That's on our our site's inventory. It's a very large parcel with some housing already on it. If they were to come in and redevelop, that's one that we could utilize. If we had um, a couple million dollars in the bank, uh, we could partner with a nonprofit and the property owner and help redevelop that site and get more affordable housing on that site. So there's another example. Yeah, uh, one final, I promise this is my last question. Uh, could we compel that or would that just need to be an arm's length transaction? Um, no, so, we, so, so but there's a couple, a couple points, Sam, you raised that I think I might be able to shed a little bit of light on. Um, and I'll come back to that. Help me remember that question because that, that maybe is the trickiest one. But one of the things I want to remind everybody of is until about 10 years ago, the city had a very active affordable housing program. We were engaged in a number of different, very large loans or grants that we were making to mobile home parks mm -hmm. to help purchase them, to uh, secure them as affordable housing for the long term. We put a million dollars into the Bay Avenue Senior Project to help get 108 units. So there's a lot of projects that are out there in the community, but what happened was we lost our redevelopment agency funding. We just haven't had that kind of money to be able to significantly engage in these affordable housing projects really since 2011. So you remember we just got the $2 million of RDA loan, uh, that $2 million RDA loan repaid to the city. So we're sort of back in this game for the first time in, in more than a decade right now. So I think that there will be more opportunities and really it's incumbent upon the city to start putting out the word to the nonprofits that we have funding and we're looking to partner on projects and that's a really a great way then to make our money go further. So for example, you know, the, the million dollars got us 108 units of Bay Avenue Senior, um, it, but, but it does take time to develop these projects. Then your next question was about the, um, can, we, um, can we buy into projects? Absolutely. 
you know, absolutely with the mall, that's been something that I thought a lot about is, you know, over, would we want to buy in and get extra affordability in the project? That's definitely the kind of thing I've seen on multiple projects over time. Maybe they're required or they're proposing 10% moderate. We come back and say, well, let's, you know, throw some money in here. Let's get 15%, you know, 10 of them is now low income, low, low level. And then I think the last question you asked was a, uh, sort of compelling a development project. That is really difficult. Technically, the city does have the power of eminent domain. It could theoretically be used for an affordable housing project, but that's a very ag aggressive approach that I haven't seen um, very many yeah. cities take and probably would really only be considered if we had multiple parcels and just one of them wouldn't play ball or something. Yeah. No, and Jamie, that one, thanks, thanks for that uh, reminder about the history. That's very helpful. And, and I wasn't thinking in terms of eminent domain, but whether our inclusionary ordinance um, could, uh, you know, allow us to insert ourselves and our money in to create more affordable housing. That, that's what I was thinking about. And I think the answer there is it would really be part of a negotiated agreement um, yeah. okay. that we could, but we probably can't force our way in. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to just piggyback off of what Vice Mayor's story and push back a little bit um, about your original question, Vice Mayor. Um, so m my concern is that there is there will not be not enough money. This is kind of a game of cat and mouse, right? If we would we move it to $25 a square foot and the developers are able to pay out, that we actually end up with too much money that when we look at our zoning for affordable housing, like in the, the hotel um, plans that was presented, Katie, you know, how much affordable housing do we have zoned in our community is my question. And this is kind of like a mathematical question, right? And I know you don't have the answer, but my point is like, how much do we have zoned for affordable housing in the city of Capitola? And ultimately, how much would that cost to build, to actually build, if we were one day to re meet all of our new arena numbers, the thousands and thousands of new projects, you know, how much would that cost us? And, you know, is that so extraordinary that, yes, indeed, we need to, char uh, that it's okay that developers pay out the $25 a square foot. So, Katie, have you guys looked at, as I'm processing this all, I'm putting this together, have you looked at how much zoning we have for affordable housing in the city of Capitola, how much property, and I know there's a better way to to say that, but I hope you're following what I'm saying. Yeah, um, so, you know, we have very specific the affordable housing overlay that I could quantify right. for you, and it's very well, uh, you know, it, it, it can, within our affordable housing overlay, we can meet our RENA numbers. So we could get to that um, during this cycle, I think it's 143 units that were acquired, or, you know, were our assigned RENA numbers. Um, so I, I know that we produced one unit this cycle, and we're in our sixth year. And altogether, we've produced 51 units in Capitola, because, and I think about half of those, or just shy of half, are ADUs. So the ADU, the state legislation, has been effective the last couple of years. But... Um, so we definitely have affordable housing overlay sites for up to 143 units that could be developed and where we could utilize this money to partner. And beyond that, there's no limitation to our residential and mixed use areas for producing affordable housing projects. And it's actually incentivized by the state that you can take advantage of certain programs to, uh, you know, the density bonus programs and um, to get additional height and less parking requirements. So it's, there's really, we have those um, identified sites within our housing element, but then it really is wide open in terms of the overall availability for on, on larger sites within Capitola to do some projects. Right. So, mm -hmm. And so ultimately what we're seeing is that it becomes the business of the city to 
start building the affordable housing. It, it, the the task, the baton, is ultimately passed to the city, and it's our responsibility to to start to build the affordable housing, no longer relying on the developers. Is that what 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 we're seeing as a I would say the shift. I would say the shift is that the city becomes, you know, we've become part of the bank. We can invest and partner with nonprofits, and like Bay Avenue uh, Senior Housing, the amount of administration that is ongoing for the city, we don't own it. It's managed by a third, you know, a, a, right. an independent nonprofit. So it's really we assist in the deal making and produce funds for it. But after that, we just make sure that they're doing their reporting. And, and my last question then is um, about our our ultimate uh, breakup, you know, with the housing authority. So we were partnering with them to support us and it's not within this, our city's bandwidth to kind of to, to take on such a large um, responsibility, responsibility of, of building new and more affordable housing, by making these changes, what would we have to see within the city? What would we have to change if we were to move to $25 a square foot, starting to get all this money? Is it within the city's bandwidth to actually make these projects come to fruition? I think so. Um, there's So I think you, you were referencing a CDBG grant opportunity that we had in the past that was really to update existing units for people who had needs to improve their the heaters and hot water systems. So that, that was different. And we do work with the Housing Authority on other matters. Um, but in terms of our bandwidth, I think this is actually, it would actually be easier for us if we were to move into this model of collecting more fees because the administration that goes into our inclusionary units, the smaller units that at Terra court we got one unit out of the 11 in until that as long as that remains affordable we have to check we have to work every time uh, that you, unit takes new ownership and goes up for sale so it really does take staff time and I reached out to our housing consultant that's been happening to has been helping us with this for years and she estimated probably at close to like 250 hours a year, maybe a little bit less on her work for inclusionary, because it is, it's a lot of work for the, I think we have 21 inclusionary units. So anytime they go up for sale or they're refinanced, there's paperwork associated with those. Whereas the Bay Avenue project, um, we get, they send us a report to say how they're in compliance. Um, so it's really less administration in the long run and less, um, of, of a, almost a burden on the city's uh, like costs in the long run, but there is quite a bit of work that would go into that partnership and getting the deal done. Okay, thank you, Council Member Peterson. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to to clarify um, something, and and Katie, correct me if I'm wrong, because I know this is all really complicated stuff, and and this is just based on what I believe I understand from our, our conversation and back last night. Um, but one is that um, our arena numbers, it is our responsibility as, as a city to ensure that we are planning to meet those, correct? Like it's not on developers, it's not on anyone else, it's on us as a city to make sure that these numbers get met, right? And then my other understanding is that if we don't do that, we will be held responsible in a way that makes us no longer eligible for um, participating in the kind of streamlined approval for affordable housing under SB 35. So we are kind of, this is a responsibility of us as a city to ensure that we're finding ways to um, produce uh, affordable housing. Um, and so if I'm understanding correctly, and, and I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm fully uh, aware of what I'm voting on here, if I'm understanding correctly, we could keep the 15% uh, requirement that we have now, but even though that's infeasible, it would become feasible if we say, if you don't build this 15% um, affordable housing, you can instead pay $25 a square feet for uh, a square foot for the for sale units. 
and then we would take that money, add it to our former RDA funds, and then could build an entirely 100% affordable complex. Is that correct? That would give us, you know, all the units or a majority of the units would be affordable, which we could get much quicker in that one project than we could over a long period of time with projects that give us one or two affordable units here and there. Am I understanding this all correctly? You, you are. Yep. We do have an obligation okay. through the state, and we could utilize that money to help us get there. So and okay. it would go into our affordable housing trust fund. Okay. This is, this is a very complicated issue. So okay. I appreciate You've got it, though. You've got it. Would it be helpful for us to bring up the slide again, or? No, I, I'm, I'm sorry, to Council Member Bertrand. And Council Member, you're muted. There we go. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have a question of staff. Are we monitoring ADUs as potentially affordable housing units? We are. Um, and so, what are we seeing? What are we seeing at this point? So what we are seeing, we actually sent out a letter regarding this this year to all the ADU uh, that ADU units that have been produced. If we get documentation um, of what income levels the first rental goes to, we can actually get credit for that income level within our arena numbers. So um, once I learned that, we sent out letters and. We're seeing actually um, that they would classify in the lower income levels only because people seem to be renting them at no cost to family or close friends or very low cost. And then there have been a few that are the exception that are at moderate or above moderate. But many of the um, the feedback of, of the folks of the like maybe 10 letters that we've gotten back, the majority of them are at, at lower levels because they're renting them at low rates for friends or not charging them at all. Well, this, this sounds very encouraging. I can see they're not doing market rate, but they're doing something that provides housing, which is ultimately what we thought of the ADU program as doing, maybe for family and close friends. So that makes sense. Um, so in general, I'm all for this form of collecting money, whether we go from up to $25 or not, uh, we need to decide. But if it goes into a fund to build housing on any level that provides resources to people, yeah. Um, so I know the question for um, our consultants. In Capitola, we have a lot of second homes, which by and large from my perspective, takes away from the availability of housing for residents and people that live here. So I'm saying second home, someone that lives somewhere afield and they come here once a year, maybe once a weekend, I don't know, but not very often. <laughs> so is this part of your nexus study? For the purposes of our next study, we assumed that the uh, homes would be full-time occupied. Um, and I know I totally understand what you're um, talking about, that, that that is a common practice in Capitola as it is in Sonoma County and other places where we have worked on these kinds of things before. Um, from a nexus standpoint, though, we feel that the, the strongest way to establish that relationship is by assuming that a home is a home uh, and could be occupied. There's no legal prohibition saying that folks can't be there all the time. Um, and so the assumption is that they would. Um, and in so doing, they, they have a uh, greater impact on the, the nexus-based need for affordable housing. And as we've talked about, the nexus analysis that we've done um, is ultimately not how we're recommending that you reconsider your current program. It is a background document at this point. Um, and instead, what we are talking about is making adjustments that are below the levels uh, 
that are justified by the nexus because the feasibility kind of prevails um, over the, the nexus findings. So that's perhaps a, a longer way than I needed to of saying, um, yes, second homes are a way of, uh, of affecting the availability of affordable housing or housing period. Um, but from a, a legal perspective, we've addressed this in the most straightforward way that we could, uh, rather than saying we will charge folks extra for the fact that they are removing that home from the full-time circulation of, of housing stock. There are communities that have adopted or are considering adopted, uh, considering adopting vacant unit taxes. Um, and what that might do is push more of those units into short-term rentals, unless you have a corresponding limitation on that. Um, but for instance, Vancouver uh, in British Columbia has a tax on vacant units that is meant to make sure that, that any unit in town is in fact occupied, um, but there may be uh, unintended consequences of taking that particular approach. Thank you very much, Darren. Yeah, I'm familiar with the one in Vancouver, and because um, I was looking on the web trying to deal, uh, come up with some examples how Capitola might deal with this. So the um, reason why I asked the question is because part of your calculation um, basically says that if a house is occupied, um, there's people spending money in the community. Um, this is in turn, um, you know, there's a whole snowball effect because a house is occupied. And um, that's not happening with houses that are second homes. So, you know, including those homes, I think, changes the results of the Nexus study. I, I don't think second homes should be part of your Nexus study at all because it doesn't fit into your logic that your whole study is based on. So I think that that throws a big ball in front of the car that's trying to go down the street. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how you look at that, but you know, and we have a, a, a sizable number of rental, excuse me, of second homes here. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is absolutely a, a true statement. Uh, I think perhaps an analog would be a school fee or a parks fee. Um, the presumption is when a, a unit is being built uh, that it will be occupied. And the same for sewer hookups. You know, you, you are assuming that that toilet will flush a certain number of times. Um, and if somebody doesn't, ju just because the person who is originally building it doesn't intend to be there all of the time, doesn't mean that the second owner, the third owner, and so on won't be there all of the time. And so the, the standard practice is to assume that it's a full-time unit. Um, and as a reminder, the type of fee or requirement that we're talking about is for new construction. It is not for existing units that may convert to a second home at some point or, or what have you. Um, so again, that's sort of the analogous situation is other impact fees in general, transportation, whatever it may be. The assumption is that a home is occupied rather than not occupied. Okay. Well, I take your point about new construction, although some new construction here is for second homes. So sure, I think sure. that's a good point. Um, other fees are because we have to provide a service and we can't make exclusions. Uh, whoever claims they don't use garbage, that doesn't make any sense when you have to provide a sewer, uh, you know, a pickup service for everyone. So those are my two questions. It's unfortunate that um, according to your analysis, the high end homes generate more, uh, less fees than you know something in terms of your graph at 500,000. So um, I hate the way it's skewed because it seems to me- a I, home, a And home. I'm gonna jump in real quick. I just want, I, Council Member Bershon, I want you to save those comments just for our comments I'm part. Trying, I I'm, want us to go to pu public, um, public comment. Do you have any other questions at this time? I will finish my question later. If you, if it's a question, please, I just want to make sure we give our public an opportunity and then we'll come back for more um, discussion. I'll finish it later and get the public opportunity to talk right now. Okay. Um, any other questions at this time? So we're going to move to um, open public comment for this item. If you'd like to make a comment, send an email now to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. 
or to speak, please raise your hand now by clicking on reactions, then clicking raise hand in your Zoom application, or by dialing star nine or six on your landline mobile phone or mobile phone. Our moderator will unmute you. You will have up to three minutes to speak. Mayor Brooks, I do not see any attendees wishing to speak on this item, and I do not have any emails on this item. Okay, we'll just wait one more second for our participants or attendees to raise their hand. Okay. All right, Council Member Bertrand, we're going to come back and start with you for further comments and um, discussion. I'll have my comments later. I just want to answer my ask my question. So in terms of the fees that are received in terms of your nexus study, I'm trying to understand the logic. Uh, it just is counter logic to me that a house that is in $2 million in terms of your table generates less fees and a house that is 500,000 generates more fees. And it seems to me that it's counter to logic. You know, the, the guy that's going to build a $2, uh, $2 million house can pay a lot more for that fee. <laughs> so uh, if you can explain that logic, I just want to understand it. Yes. Katie, you're running the show at this point, is that correct? Um, you, you've got the screen? Yeah. yeah. Go back okay. to the table or something. I could could you go to page six, please? Thank you. So, um, council member, I understand your confusion because we were focused on the fee per square foot, which okay. does does have sort of a a. a I guess, regressive uh, aspect to it. But if you look in the second column here, the fee per unit, um, you will see that the smaller, uh, less expensive units, the fee on those units would be lower. Uh, they, they do scale up with the size and value of the unit. Um, it's just that it's not a linear relationship. Um, and so you'd have a $35,000 fee on a half million dollar house and a $60,000 fee on a million dollar house. Okay, um, so you're thinking of square feet as part of this then? Right. That, okay, got it. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Council Member Peterson. Thank you. Can we go back to the slide? Yeah, there we go. Um, I'm ready to make a motion uh, to recommend Sorry, I'm trying to get through all this, this detail again because it's, it's super complicated. I just want to make sure that I'm saying the right thing. So uh, I want to recommend that we make a motion. Uh, I'm going to make a motion that recommends we increase the in lieu and impact fee to $25 per square feet, square foot. Uh, actually, it's all three, right? I can, I can make a motion that includes all three of these things because they're all for different things, one of them's for new development, one's for additions, and one's for rental. Is that correct, Katie? It is. I can make um, it. it. You'll want to clarify on number three if you want to keep the rental housing fee at $6 a square foot, lower it, or remove it. Perfect. Okay. So then I will make a motion um, to adopt the recommendations for one and two and to keep rental housing fee at $6 per square feet foot for for number three, um, and then uh, make a motion for option number one under the inclusionary requirement. Did that was that clear, Chloe? I know I wasn't very uh, eloquent in that motion. I think I have it. I I think so. Thank you. Okay. I'll that was that point enough for me. I'll second it. Oh, <laughs> I heard Council Member Bertrand second yeah. that motion. So, um, just for clarification, before we go to a roll call, um, I'm hearing that the uh, the motion on the table is to um, adopt 
or to adopt the recommendation for items one, uh, recommendation for in lieu and impact fee for item one, increasing in lieu and impact fee to 25 square feet. And number two, keep $2.50 square feet for home additions over 50%. And item three, to keep the rental housing fee at $6 per square foot. And in addition to uh, adopt the recommended options for inclusionary requirement, option one, which is to keep inclusionary requirement at 15% and include a 25 square foot fee out option to maintain feasibility. Is that yes. correct? <laughs> Yes. So we have a motion on the table from Council Member Peterson and a second from Council Member Bertrand. Would there be anyone, any other council members like to make any further comments or deliberation at this time? Yeah. Council Mayor, Member Bertrand. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Kristen, I just want some clarification, not from you, but um, maybe from the staff that presented the study. And I remember some comments earlier um, when we first had this subject, the mayor said, excuse me, the city manager said, basically, we haven't done any rental housing at all. And so I want to ask the uh, consultants, wasn't, um, if you don't mind, the issue of affordability in terms of rental housing didn't seem to make, meet the 5.25%. Is that correct? In terms of your study? That is correct. Okay, and I was wondering, Kristen, if we could consider lowering this so that even no fee, just to partially encourage rental housing development. If we don't have any right now, we're charging fee fees potentially for a project that's not even feasible in terms of the Nexus study. Maybe it'd be wise for us to try to encourage rental housing by lowering that fee. You're referring to the uh, the rental housing fee at six dollars per square foot. Yes, I am, Kristen. I was just thinking if, maybe we can do something to encourage it. That's all. If I remember correctly from the presentation, even without a fee, it's still considered infeasible. Is that you correct? Are correct? That even if we have zero fee, it's considered not feasible to build. Um, yes. So I, I don't really feel comfortable lowering it or removing it. Because if it's going to be infeasible either way, I would prefer that we are able to collect funds to put towards a, an affordable housing development if anyone who creates rental housing chooses not to put affordable um, units in, in their complex. Because otherwise, if there's no fee, there, there's no reason for them to build affordable units anyway. And so if I understand it correctly, then if there's no fee or a lower fee, you know, I, I just I just see it as if there's no fee, there's no reason for them to uh, build affordable units whatsoever. And if there is one, at least we get the funds. If they're not going to build the, the units, at least we get the funds to put towards the units that we would build, if I'm understanding this correctly. So I hear what you're saying, Kristen. And um, I think that a developer who wants to build rental housing will be doing it irrespective because first of all it's according to the nexus fee maybe not feasible they're willing to take less of a uh, a profit margin so if they're willing to take less of a profit margin to build rental housing i would like to encourage them so that's why i'm asking if you could adjust the motion and i would agree if you adjust it to lower are you asking for an amendment or making one or or um, if you're asking me to amend my motion, I'm going to have to politely decline. Okay, well, that, that's, that's the impression I got. So. Um... Okay, so you are the seconder on that motion that's on the table. Any other comments from council before I have a roll call vote? Okay, Chloe. Yes, council member Bertrand. I agree. Councilmember Kaiser. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Story. Aye. Mayor Brooks. Aye. Thank you. Okay, Darren and Jake and Katie, thank you so much for this really thorough um, study and presentation tonight. 
it was actually very clear at the end of it all. So I appreciate your time and staying up till 9.36 p.m. tonight with us. We're going to move on to our... Yeah, thank thank you. you. Okay, we're going to move on to our next item. And I should say that last item passed unanimously. Um, Next item we're going to move on to is item C, which is the Capitola Branch Library Project in consideration of contract change orders. Steve, thanks for sticking with us. This is your item. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for uh, giving us a chance here to put one more item in front of you. I'm going to share my screen. I hope you're now seeing. So this is a report on the library. I'm hoping uh, and planning that this is the penultimate uh, report. We should have one more report coming to you uh, when we will approve a contract or a uh, notice of completion for the project. Um, The item before you tonight is approving change orders number 17.1 and 17.2. So to give you a quick project status, as you are well aware, the project has been open and enjoyed, enjoyed by the public since June 15th. There's been lots of uh, rave reviews about it. Uh, I think everybody is appreciative of the efforts that have gone in from the city, the architect, the contractor to build a beautiful building. Um, the construction contract is 99% complete. We just have some minor fencing to continue to add. It's uh, We've been going through quite a few design changes on that, and I think the, uh, the final fencing is now being fabricated. There's some bookshelving modifications um, that the library district required. We had in, the equipment came, the shelving came with some shelving that uh, didn't quite work quite. Um, it's a rather minor expense to put in a different type of shelving. We're just waiting for that to be delivered. Uh, and then there's some Painting the letters on the monument sign to make them pop out a little bit more um, is, was in the original contract and hasn't been completed. Besides the, those work items, there's close-off documentation and training. Uh, the contractor needs to have the building official issue a final certificate of occupancy. They need to provide us with as drawings and warranties and certifications and conduct one last staff training uh, for the library staff. We anticipate the project being completed in October. Just to bring you current with the change order history. So this is through change order 16, which is, have all been approved in accordance with the change order policy adopted for this project. Um, there's been $847,724 in cost reductions approved through change orders that were results uh, from value engineering efforts, which uh, took part at the beginning of the project. Through change order 16, there's been $1,255,000 in increases for costs for work and delays not included in the contract. Of those $1,255,000, about $750,000 of that is from changes caused by the conflict with the power lines. And remember, that's just through 16. We're now looking at 17.1 and 17.2 change orders. Change order one um, is all related to the conflict with the power line. It's for $250,000 in change. It's for compensable delays to auto construction as they were delayed in completing the project due to the uh, conflict. It's temporary. It's for temporary modifications to the wall systems and moisture control systems they put in last winter to dry out the building while we're waiting to get the power lines relocated to allow us to actually dry it in and start heating up the building and doing interior work. Uh, There's also a minor amount of additional costs for delays to subcontractors. Change order 17.2 is all extra work. This is typically what we see at close out of a project. There's 28 items of work that are detailed in the change order in the agenda packet. Um, The largest is about a $31,000 change order for changes required by the fire marshal to put in and involved uh, the fire sprinkler system and the ease, the the overhangs you see, we didn't want to put uh, sprinklers in the overhangs um, because they would be inaccessible. So we had to modify the building for that. Um, And it also includes, um, you know, it's down to an $800 change we had to do to get the book drop to to work. 
Um, it does include reducing the re retention, the amount of the contract we retain, to make sure all the contract subcontractors are paid from 4% to 3%. So I'll give you a quick contract summary. The original contracts uh, that was awarded was for $12,325,000. The net change order, and now this includes 17.1 and 17.2, is $857,000. So the current construction contract is for $13,182,000. One final change order is anticipated. The scheme of things is $30,000. I don't want to say that's small. Uh, but it's smaller than we've been looking at recently, and it will be brought to the council with a notice of completion. So to give you a, a project update, uh, looking at the revenue, this hasn't changed in a while. Um, we will update this and give you the final investment earnings. I think all the other, the Measure F, Successor Agency, General Fund, the Friends Donations, and the County Library Funds are all accurate. Investment earnings, there may be some additional funding that we will true up when we give the final report on the project. But with, the total revenue is $15,800,000. Looking at our projected expenses through con contract change or 17.2, we have the contract amount of $13,182,000. And you can see the other fees here for engineering services, permits and special inspections, project management, miscellaneous uh, furniture and PG&E costs for actually moving the wires. So our expenses uh, are projecting at $15,573,000. So looking at a summary, we have a project budget of $15,800,000, projected expenses of fifteen five through seventeen one seventy two. That gives us the remaining balance of $230,000. Of course, we have another, but one more change order at $30,000, which we are anticipating. So we now have a $200,000 balance at the close out of project. I know this is less than we had, I think, last projected. Um, the, the costs have just continued to uh, grow on this project uh, due to, I think it was the finalizing, 17.2 is actually finalizing the cost there. Um, it was probably a little higher than we had anticipated. And then the delays have continued as we've been waiting for the contractor to be complete. But we're pretty confident that $200,000 close out at this point of the project, and we may have some additional uh, savings or earnings, investment earnings coming our way. So with that, the recommended action tonight is to approve contract change order 17.1 and, sorry about the typo, 17.2 in the amounts of $250,776 and $198,921, respectively. And with that, I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions. And we also have our project manager, Dave Tanza, with Bogart Construction, who is uh, here tonight with us, is available to answer any specific questions you may have about the change orders. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Dave, did you need to add anything before we go to comments or questions from council? No, I think Steve did a great thing. Good evening, everyone. Nice to be proud to of the you. project. Turned out really well. Excellent. Okay, so council members, any questions for David or Steve? Council member for Trent. No, thank you, Mary. Um, I can only imagine what the training is, but Steve, can you sort of give me an idea what the staff training is? And then I have a follow-up question. I think when we were first talking about uh, traffic and all that um, going in and out of the parking lot, there was some mention of a pedestrian walkway after the final design had been uh, decided upon and all that. So those are my two uh, questions about those areas. So the training is just going through all the systems one more time with the staff, the heating system, the lighting systems, they're all very modern, shall I say, in that they're uh, computer generated and and not just switches anymore uh, to, to meet energy efficiency requirements. So it's just going over, making sure the staff is aware and the people that are maintaining it, what the systems are, what different things are, uh, you know, how the drainage works and things and items of those nature. So it's, so it's one last chance for the library staff and county who are going to maintain it to, to get the, all the information they need going forward. As far as the pedestrian pathway, I'm not 
I can't recollect exactly what you're referring to. Could you elaborate a little on your second question? Well, I remember asking about that, and you know, I was made aware that that was going to be considered at some point in the future, and so I was just bringing it up now if it's on your agenda. A pedestrian pathway from where to where? Um, from the parking lot exit to the corner and possibly up to the crosswalk that, you know, there's that little ramp that goes up to um, Wharf Road at the end of the wall, I think. So I didn't know the extent of the crosswalk because it wasn't defined, but it was definitely go to the corner from some point. And so I if thought- you're talking about a sidewalk along Wharf Road? Yeah, a side- that's From, yeah, from the sidewalk. driveway yeah, to, right. to the intersection. Yeah. So it wasn't closed design because we really want people to, to access the library from Clare Street. Um, okay. The driveway, we could put the, drive, the, the sidewalk in there. Um, we, there's, there's room in the design between the bioswale and the existing curb. But the access to the library for pedestrians, especially coming from that intersection, is uh, to direct them up through up Clare Street and then through the top lot and into the building that way. We really want, don't want them walking up the driveway. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and take uh, open public comment. If you'd like to make a um, comment, you can send an email now to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Or to speak, please raise your hand now by clicking on reactions then clicking raise hand in your Zoom application or by dialing star nine or star six, depending what kind of phone you have on your landline or your mobile phone. Our moderator will unmute you. You will have three minutes to speak. Mayor Brooks, I do not see any attendees with their hands raised for this item and I do not have any emails on this item. Okay, council members, you are looking sharp. I think this is the latest we might have ever gone. All right, let's bring this back for further comments and a vote. Any comments from council? Okay, I'm going to jump in then. Steve, I have um, just in regards to the project itself, I have some concerns still around safety and those who are exiting the driveway and going left onto wharf and um, I wanted to bring that to your attention. There's a lot of students uh, walking around and myself, I have almost been T-boned um, two times now coming out of that library. Um, it is a major, major concern of mine and I hope that you and David can go back and look at how we can mitigate that up, um, as an issue. I recognize it's 25 miles per hour on Wharf Road. I tested that and had three cars behind me really upset that I was going 25 miles an hour. Um, so I really would like for you to think about that. I know we have another change order coming up and I don't know if that needs to be part of that when it returns, but I'd like to see that. Um, any other comments from council? Okay. Um, so, would someone like to make a motion? I accept the I'll make a motion to accept the order. I'll change order, excuse me. Okay, we have a motion to approve the contract change order 17 1 and 2 in the amounts of 250000 and 198000 respectively. I can second that. And Council Member Kaiser seconded. May I have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Bertrand. I approve. Councilmember Kaiser. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Story. Aye. Mayor Brooks. Aye. Okay, item D, administrative policy update. We're going to receive a report this evening. Yes. Mayor and Council, I have a brief PowerPoint I will share with you and try to keep it relatively succinct. Okay, so as Council will recall that during our goal setting and budget prioritization process this last spring, we identified updates to our administrative policies as one of the goals for this budget calendar year. 
Uh, as a reminder, the city of Capitola has 93 current policies. May not be a reminder for you, actually, since I didn't know that until we got into this. Uh, the administrative policies are intended to regulate kind of day-to-day -day activities, establish programs. They will oftentimes expand upon the muni code. Um, we have examples of that would be like the search school permits where we have a muni code that says we have search school permits, but then we have a policy that expands upon it and outlines the process by which we issue search school permits. So, you know, there's um, several um, admin policies about social media, some that pertain to how staff engage with social media. And then you'll remember a council adopted policy that dealt with how city officials uh, in their as being city officials would engage with social media. There's two basic kinds of policies. There's the policies that are more internal or administrative, and those are approved by me as the city manager. So examples would be we have a policy about, um, you know, employees using the, the their person using personal mail at city hall, using the city hall for, um, uh, to receive personal mail and about offering uh, notary public services to the community at large. So those are policies that are approved by the city manager. And then there's policies that are approved by the city council. And those usually have a financial component to them or more of an external face so they impact the community. So the memorial grant program would be an example of a council approved um, administrative policy. And I mentioned the surf school permits and then the social media policy that pertains to city officials are some examples. Um, as part of our review of the administrative policy, I asked all the department heads to look at the different policies that relate to the, uh, their department's activities and really just told them to give me the answer to one of th three questions, either keep the, update the policy, keep it as it is, or it's time to revoke the policy. And so uh, department heads have gone through and reviewed all the policies and identified those that need updating uh, and those uh, and our plan is, is to bring those to the city council as time allows, uh, or if they're under the city uh, staff jurisdiction, uh, update them internally as we have the resources available to do so. We've also identified four policies that really should just be revoked. Um, again, these are actually under the staff's jurisdiction, city manager jurisdiction. So there was a policy about how the, the city's digital camera was supposed to be used, um, how city owned mobile home could be rented to uh, city employees. We no longer have any city uh, owned mobile homes. Uh, overtime accumulation and bilingual pay or internal policies that have actually been subsequently incorporated into the MOUs with the groups. So they're really, they're not relevant anymore. So that's kind of the update. Um, we have, sorry, those are the ones that we want to repeal right now. We have updates that are in process right now on the policies that are listed here. Uh, council is well aware of the village uh, parking, the parklet program. It's something we've been working on a lot recently. Uh, we plan to be bringing actually a film permit ordinance, and then we'll need to update our film uh, permit policy as well. And then there's a couple other policies that we've identified that will need to be updated here in the near term. In addition, uh, these are all the other policies that staff has identified as, as requiring updates. So it's going to take a little bit of time to get through these. Um, really, we're going to try to work on them as we have resources. You'll see whenever it says CC after it on here, that means it's a city council policy. And then the policies that are don't have a CC are staff. Um, so that really is my update. I don't think we have any action that's required this evening, uh, but I'm available to answer any questions. Council? We got to at least make it till 10 o'clock. So any questions? No? Okay, so Council Member Kaiser. Yes, what, Jamie, thank you for that, is the um, filming ordinance all about? Oh, so <laughs> I've learned a lot about filming ordinances. Interestingly enough, we have had a film permit that we've issued ever since I've been here, but it turns out that film permits are actually very special things under California law and we don't really have a film a film permit. We have a business license that we issue to people that want to film. So we need to correct that. 
Uh, the good attorneys at Burke have been working hard with our staff to come up with a film permit ordinance that we actually have to have reviewed by the California Film Commission. And then subsequently, we can bring it to the city council for your consideration. So that's the update with the film permit. Thank you. Sure. Uh, council member Bertrand. You're muted. Um, Margo, thanks for leading. Oh no, council member Bertrand, you're frozen. Okay, well, we will wait a second. Any other questions? Um, Jamie, just for clarification, if council wants to review these policies, all 93 of them, are they available on our website or do we have access to them? That was actually something that I meant to talk to the city clerk about before the meeting. So I'd be ready for this question and I didn't talk to her. Um, Chloe. Yes. Do the council members have these all in their uh, binders so, in the council handbook? So to my knowledge, uh, kind of at the beginning of a term and when we've done onboarding, the you know extremely relevant policies have been sent to council, uh, not all 93, that would be a lot. I do know they're available on a Dropbox, so I can make everyone um, have access to that, all of council, if they want to review all 93. They are not on our city website. Does that answer the question? Yeah, so I think council would love to read all 93 of them and or at least have them available to them if you want to share that with us. Okay. Um, and and Jamie, the one last thought I had was in regards to our um, tech use, I'm going to forget the name of it, for our, um, we all get can get a stipend for for I think it's a tablet or something like that um, and I don't know if that was on your list that you you kind of skimmed through it but I'd like for that to be looked at again um, and to get some council input in the future on um, on how much we get and if that's realistic um, as a possible stipend and if that language is even updated Quite honestly, I haven't looked since we have not had access to all 93 policies. I wasn't prepared to give any all that input yet, and I'm, I know it's going to come back. But I think that's important for council to to look at at the uh, at a next meeting. Yeah, we can certainly add that it's the digital e-reader policy. Uh, we can. Add yeah, I don't know for updating with you. Okay, great, uh, Council Member Bertrand, are you back? And go ahead and unmute yourself. I was just wondering what happened and how far I got if I pushed the wrong button or something. You were thanking Margo for her comments. Yeah, that's right. Okay, um, so another policy, um, I was just wondering, so you have the little um, airplanes that people fly around, the, you know, four little propellers and the drones, you know, little drones, whatever people call them. I think we have a policy on that, like it's illegal to fly them in Capitola and, and record. Is that true? So we do not have a drone. I think it, typically um, drones would be dealt with by ordinance. Okay. Um, policy. Samantha might be able to shine more light on it, but we don't have a drone policy. Okay. Because, you know, there's someone that came to me and said, I took this and I know it's illegal. And I said, I have no clue. Go ask someone at City Hall. And that was the last I heard. So that's the basis of my question. Thank you. There are FAA rules and Monterey Bay Area Sanctuary rules about commercial use of drones. Um, that may have been what the person was referring to. Great. Okay. Well, since there's no action required, we can now move on to item 10 at exactly 10 p.m. That was my goal, four hours in. I appreciate all of your time, everyone. We are at adjournment. I will see you next time. Please remember to be kind to yourselves and to everybody else during all of these challenging times. Thank you for all that you do, staff. We'll see you next time. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Goodbye.